o'clock, so I will call to order uh, this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on April 3rd, 2023. <laughs> And I will note that uh, Danny Kellerman uh, is not going to be able to make it tonight. Uh, we wish her a speedy recovery and uh, hope that she's able to participate uh, in our next meeting. Uh, with the agenda, uh, Tom has asked that we add a short executive session to the end of the agenda. So put that in uh, at uh, 8.55. Uh, and uh, with that addition, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Could I also make a slight addition? It will be probably a two-minute discussion about um, board emails. Board emails, you okay. probably got stuff from Bob Butler. Oh, right. Okay. Um, yeah, let's uh, put that uh, right after the public session at uh, 7 uh, 14. Anything else? No? Okay. Still waiting for a motion. So I make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. All right. And do I have a second? I'll second. All right. Uh, moved by uh, Mike and seconded by Kane. Any further discussion? All in favor of uh, the amended uh, agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The agenda is approved. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items? So moved. Okay. Second. And again, seconded by Kane. <coughs> Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The consent agenda is approved. Okay. Just, Mike. Just Mr. Chair, this is maybe more for Kane's kind of, yeah. you know, if, if, if we could just talk about the differences between first and third class and second class licenses. I'm well aware. Of You're well aware? Okay. <laughs> then then in the industry. I am in the restaurant industry. Then nothing further said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure because those are all there. If you don't know what they are, mm -hmm. clarification would be wired. Alyssa. Well, and I was just going to say, Karen, as our clerk, does an outstanding job preparing them. And even last week, I noted that she had said, like, two outdoor consumption permits for McGill and Cuddy's, which wound up being because they have literally two spaces that had to be licensed separately. So Karen does the behind the scenes when it gets to us. I personally feel really good about it. Very good. Um, if there's no further discussion on that, uh, let's open up the public session. Uh, this is a uh, time for uh, anyone uh, from the public to address uh, anything that's not on the warned agenda. And we request that you keep your comments uh, limited to three minutes. Uh, if we need more, we can add it to the agenda for the following meeting. Anyone would like to speak? Chris Jens, come on up. Um. Thanks for taking the time to and well, you say a couple things. Um, first thing I want to point out, I'm not looking to throw anybody under the bus, and maybe there's a reason for it, but I didn't see the posting for the agenda until Sunday on the yeah, website. I, I can speak to that, Chris. Okay. I posted it on Friday on the internet, and this is, please don't ask me for an explanation. I don't understand. <laughs> I could see it on my computer. But when I got a text message from the previous town clerk, she couldn't see it. And I went back online from home and I could still see it. So I thought, well, I don't understand. And it wasn't until Sunday that I hit the little uh, lightning bolt in the upper right hand corner of the typo page and it populated on the internet. So okay. I apologize. But no, I did have it posted at three public places <coughs> so we're in compliance. I figured as but much. But it just, uh, I just, 
I just didn't want somebody to. Uh, I bet I never forget to hit that lightning bolt yeah. again. You can tell your wife I said that. That's how she trained me. I bet you never forget that again. <laughs> and something happened Sunday because I was I was logged in from home and I kept getting booted out. So I wonder oh. if there was other internet issues or power or something. But I've never had that. I literally could see it on my desktop, but no, no one. Else. I couldn't see it on my phone or my personal. Anyway. I, I can't explain why it freaked out on me on Friday I knew there was or on a, Saturday. I knew there was a reasonable explanation yeah. for it. So but by good. Sunday, I hit the lightning bolt. And yeah. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so a couple prior meetings, um, there was discussion about uh, the town attempting to conduct a reappraisal uh, of our properties. And uh, I've since heard that the uh, State has now decided to take that in their hands. Um, I don't have much confidence in our state elected leaders. Uh, so I'm wondering how the town feels about that. I'm looking for some comments for that. Uh, Alyssa? I was going to start by deferring to Tom, but just say what I heard is that Ted Brady, who's the executive director of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, on behalf of that organization raised concerns and then I had seen that it had passed and not passed in other bodies so I don't track the legislature super closely but I understand it's evolving so I don't know if Tom has the more up to date of that Tom. I think like any bill it's evolving until it's law. Um, so we have to, there's, I think the number is 156 towns have to appraise right now and the way, the way it works is um, the state has a number called common level of appraisal they update every year and essentially is a measure of how far off from the market you are. And once you hit 80% of market value, um, you've got to reappraise. Um, so with housing going crazy, right. we're all there. And, and the ones that are not there this year, are they reappraised in the last couple of years or are they going to be there next year? Right. Um, there's not enough appraisers to go around. This has been an issue um, that I think needed to be addressed at the state level or by VLCT some years back, but there's just a dearth of, of firms out there. Right. If we had to do it, we're lucky because our appraiser is working with, with Stowe's appraiser right now to do it, and that team is in place so they can do it for us quickly. Um, I actually think it's a great thing if the state would take it over for a few reasons. So the first is, it's a couple hundred grand. Um, so if the state wants to pay for it, the state wants to pay for it. Now they, mm -hmm. the state gives us a chunk of revenue each year to pay for reappraisal. Mm -hmm. 20, 25 grand. Um, you're supposed to reserve that, which we do. I suspect a lot of towns don't and just budget the revenue. Mm -hmm. um, either way, you've got to pay for the reappraisal when the time comes. So the state wants to intercept a $200,000 liability and do the work. Um, I'm okay with that. That mm -hmm. frees up $200,000 that we were going to use ARPA funds for. Correct. So that's $200,000 for whatever else. Um, the other piece is um, it's a bit odd, I think, going a town-by-town -town approach to reappraisal. Um, process is you basically sample enough of the houses and businesses to get some representative sample of the town. And not only do you revalue everyone, but you create in our system what we call a, a system of uniform values. So if you're three years post reappraisal and you add a room to your house, we don't need to go see your house. We need to just know the square footage. And the system tells us, based on everyone else's square footage, what that adds to your property. Same thing if you add a deck or a swing pool, that sort of thing. Um, so you get really granular data. But towns don't exist in a vacuum. Right. So if the state, the state is proposing essentially districts here, and I think it makes sense to reappraise on more of a regional basis, because um, that's how real estate moves. I mean, there's, there's always some local variation. And, um, you know, people move sometimes based on school districts, so that might influence things. So there's a lot of factors the state would come into play, but I think if the state could, you know, build a team, I don't know how many, I speculate, you know, 10, mm -hmm. something like that. They could do a region a year, every six or eight years, which is their plan, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's never going to be perfect, but 
Uh, it's not perfect now. And the other challenge I think you have now is, especially in smaller towns, is there's sometimes a little bit of a gap between the horsepower you have and sometimes the counterparty who might be a multi-million dollar developer. Um, and so I think if you've got more of a trained team, you've got a better ability to capture some of the really expensive stuff mm -hmm. uh, statewide, just my opinion on that. So you said, I'm sorry, you said the town uh, acquires how much from the state every year? Twenty, twenty-five thousand. Yeah, it's in that range. Don't quote so me on that. So in the time span that reappraisal <coughs> occur, that two hundred is basically almost a gifted to us. There's no such thing as free money, but so it's not like we're going to be accumulating an addition. We're, we're not saving <coughs> ourselves two hundred thousand. We're just the it's state's just, just not giving it to us. Right. So that's not that doesn't free up additional revenue for the town. Right. Uh, and my only other concern is, and you just touched on it a little bit, is um, is to one size fits all is not the case when it comes to town to town values, uh, simply because of what each town represents sure. as far as. Uh, and again, then they're going to have to create a whole new uh, number of staff at the government level, which in turn costs us paying benefits and all that, pensions and whatnot that they can't even cover now. Uh, the challenge is bigger government. The thought. challenge without it is <clears throat> I guess the only way in the short term, if if hundred and fifty six and next year probably hundred and seventy five or two hundred towns have to reappraise is um, somehow all the local consulting firms would have to staff up. Um, but it's tough to tell a private firm to staff up for a real short-term crunch that is going to go away in a few years because it's, it's a training process for those staff. Um, I think it makes more sense to stabilize it at the state level and then, you know, you've got a bit of a crunch now, but once you get through it, you just know what your schedule is, whatever, it's six or eight years, you're just, it's going to happen. Uh, but, yes, number one, we'll have to see if they actually follow through with it. And the proof will be in the pudding after that. Yeah. I, I hope we don't lose local control and, and end up costing ourselves more in the, in the long run. So, thank you. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm going to suggest we put uh, reappraisal in the parking lot, uh, keep an eye on it, and uh, see uh, what does happen at the uh, state level. Uh, Billy Victor, you have your hand up. And thanks. I'll, I'll try to keep this short. Um, um, I wanted to just uh, remind everybody or actually inform uh, the board that, you know, the Conservation Commission is doing the Community Values Mapping Program on April 11th live at St. Leo's and April 20th online for those who can't make it. For those who don't know, uh, it's run by Fish and Wildlife, and they're basically supporting us. And what you do is you, you try to get, we're trying to target and get 100 people in town to participate to sort of tell us basically what they really like about Waterbury, what values are important to them, and then we and then we reduce that to those values on a town map. Fish and Wildlife has done this at least a dozen times that I see. It's part of their community outreach program. And so right now, what I wanted to bring to the board is, first of all, I'm happy to answer any questions, but what comes out of it is a report from Fish and Wildlife with a series of maps uh, think of heat maps. So if people want recreation, a lot of people want recreation, the maps will identify where in town the community wants recreation, if it's scenic views, if it's commercial. And the, the data can be used, the easiest ways to think about it, it's talking to Karen Nevin, she thinks this is the kind of data that she's been able to use in the past to get grant money. So the one, the one thing she's mentioned to me is she would hope that would help uh, support the effort to get grant money for trying to build a connector between Waterbury Center and the village and that project. I could see the uh, planning commission looking at this as they start figuring out what they want to do with their zoning bylaws. And I'm sure the select board would want to understand, you know, what parcels of, pro not parcels, what areas of property are really important and for what reason in town um, really helps development. We're trying to get a hundred people. So we've been pounding the pavement putting up posters this weekend, front porch forum. I'm supposed to get in front of WDEV. Um, and I guess I 
what I'm, what I'm here is to tell you about it, but to the extent you can help promote it, um, get the word out, get people out, the more people we get, the more people from different views we get, you know, my joke is if we get 25 tree huggers alone, the data isn't really very good. We really want to try to get as many people from as much diverse views as we can. So I'm trying to just pound the payments, to try to get the word out. Um, I know, Roger, you and I have been talking, but if there's something else you want to add where I'm left out or anybody, I have to answer questions. I think you did a good job. Any questions uh, to Billy? Are these uh, mostly fish and wildlife issues that are going to be discussed, or is it uh, wide open in terms of what people appreciate about Waterbury? So it, it's wide open. They have kind of a template, historic views, wildlife. Some people do recreation and fishing and hunting. Um, but I've got some flexibility in terms of what we've done. So we put some commercial in there, recreation, wildlife, um, Oh, I forget them all. Scenic views, historic areas, oh, working lands and landscapes, trying to think about places we might want the community to say, hey, it's important that we have working forests or working farms, or at least the few we have left, maybe keeping on there. So. Okay. And it's going to be 530 to 730 at St. Leo's, is that right? So it's, it's formally at 6 to 8 at St. Leo's on April 11th. I have the room from 530. Okay. And you can register on our website, the town website, under Conservation yes, Commission. Look, I, I've heard there are people who don't want to register. It's a government registry. If that's going to be an innovation, just, just have people come. Just have them come. Um, the, the key about the registry is, one, we need to know about materials, what we think we're likely to have, because we actually are going to have food or snacks. The other thing is, if we wound up getting a very small number, Fish and wildlife wouldn't want to go forward. So I think we're past that threshold. And I meant to get a number for you, but a couple of logistics got in the way today. But we were at least up to 30. But I'm, uh, you know, we still pound. And I can get I can get a number to you if you guys are interested once I find out, um, maybe tomorrow or the day after. Great. Any other questions for Bill? Anyone else have a comment they want to make during the public session? Alyssa. Um, I have two. So one was just another event to plug because I realized it was before our next meeting. Um, LEAP, our local energy action partnership, also the town's energy committee, also a nonprofit, has their annual energy fair on April 15th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at Crossit Brook. I don't own a home, so solar panels and or uh, other heat pumps are not in my personal future, but anyone else who might be interested in those types of things, I know they have a lot of informed folks. I think there's a magician at 11. Anyway, so just throwing that out there. Cool. Um, second, I wanted to just thank on public forum, um, M.T. House, who was a guest special reporter on our second paper record, um, mm -hmm. the Waterbury Roundabout, and just let folks know that um, they should read that article very carefully. They should read not only the title of that article, but the full content of it, um, and that there might not be any mega towers planned for anywhere in the Waterbury. Um, but really, thank you. It was great. I did get. Uh, text from several people saying, wait, what's going on? Um, but just so folks know. Nicely done. Thank you. <coughs> Lisa, and roundabout. We made our April 1st uh, that much more fun. Three years in a row. <laughs> My wife was fooled. <laughs> At least it wasn't the roundabout being turned in the opposite that we did that. Oh, that would be good. I'm telling you. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll be more prepared next year. Okay. Any other comments for the public session? Let's move forward. Uh, next agenda item is yours, Mike. Yep. Uh, just real briefly, probably all the select board folks have gotten an email about offering uh, town email addresses to in individuals. Mm -hmm. I know, as a matter of fact, I, Bill Butler got back to me. I said, I was surprised that he was establishing one because I know I've said in the past, I actually do not want, you know, a separate Waterbury email. And I, everything I was told was we didn't have to. The only thing I just want to find out and clarify, and maybe Tom could, I know he said, you know, it's for, 
you know, for potential open meeting law, but we all know how we can't do, I don't think that that solves anything because we have a Waterbury email address that we can't, multiples of us still can't get on to a same email link. Doesn't change that. Um, I think the thought is it might make it easier for some people if your Waterbury work is completely separate from everything personal. Um, right. From the town's perspective, we could also always get a freedom of information request that could be post hoc. And so if someone is not on the board anymore and we get a request two years later, Bob Butler could conceivably fish out those records. Otherwise, right. we've got to go to you, uh, which may, might be a bit more of a challenge. So I think from his perspective, they're preserved on our server. Um, right. And those things do happen. Towns do get those requests from time to time. For me, it's just more of a challenge to, you know, it's hard enough sometimes keeping up on email. And, you know, he also talked about your name being in the public domain. I don't care. As a select board person, I have no problem with my email being in the public domain. I'm going to answer any questions from any resident or, you know, contractors, etc. But it just would make it a lot easier for me to, you know, if I search in one place, it's just another place that I might potentially miss because I'm probably not going to check it. But and it sounded like he said we're not forced to do it. You're not forced to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that case, uh, I think it's up to each of us to decide whether we want it or not. Uh, I'm going to opt for taking it just because uh, I think i uh, become more of a target now that I'm uh, serving as chair and it may just be easier to have a Waterbury email and then other email. Understand. I think it should be a personal okay. you know, consideration. Yeah. So all of us can uh, get back to uh, Bob um, within the next few days? Yeah, I guess the one thing I would say is that um, through Bob's work, we've got a lot better antivirus protections, things like that. So yeah, if that's what concerns me. From a Waterbury email, it's pretty darn safe. I got like five phishing emails a day with <laughs> invoices, which of course we don't have. Are, Alyssa, are you planning to use that? I just sent one out today, so that's why I haven't emailed you. Yet. Okay. Yeah, and you're still setting yours up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you can let me know when and if you choose to use it so right. I can update the web. And I'm still planning on opting out. Okay, that's, just, that's perfect. And Bob said that sounds like fun. I just wanted to clarify because he, he said, I know Kane, Danny's already been on. Mm -hmm. I know Roger has indicated for the examples. He wasn't sure about Alyssa, but she <laughs> said her. Okay. I looked today, I was afraid Tom was emailing me on it and I wasn't getting his email, so I said I best to log in and make sure that there's nothing in here. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Great. Uh, let's move on to the next agenda item. Update on roads and paving. Mr. Woodruff. For the record, we could erase my email address, I'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> All right, I think I'll just start with a brief um, update on the gravel roads. As you may know, we had a terrible mud season last year. Um, things have done a complete 180, and it looks like this year is going to be much more tolerable. Uh, and I think it's all weather related. I mean, things we don't control mainly. Um, I'm not saying we're through mud season, but we're probably doing okay. So. Mm -hmm. How do you respond? Uh, to complaints? Um, it depends. You know, this year we've had no issues where roads are completely not impassable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if the roads, roads just pot holy or just muddy, um, it's a question of whether it needs a treatment to get vehicles through or doesn't need a treatment. Um, sometimes the way it's worked this year, the weather's cooperated, it's turned cold at night. Right. We've been able to do some treatment there. We've added some gravel and stone where needed. Um, so all in all, spring weather road conditions are, I won't say excellent, but excellent for spring. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, so that's the dirt road portion. I do know in our budget, um, we had lumped out a huge sum for gravel resurfacing. Um, I think the discussion last year when we were talking, I can't remember if it was me and Tom or me, Tom and Bill, um, 
as to what road we might use that money on. Um, I think the thought process was let's see how this year's mud season is and see what road seems to be a priority. Um, but there's monies in there to do a substantial resurfacing project. And I think perhaps at next meeting, if anybody's got ideas on where that should be, if Celia wants to change her mind or if she still wants to do Sweet Road or we've got other thoughts, we can, we can reach out then, I think. Sweet Road is on the priority list, is it? Yeah, it was, it was the project Celia had put forward last year. Um, and I think at that point we were like, okay, maybe Perry Hill's a better choice, more traffic, more housing. Yeah. Um, and Perry Hill was <coughs> impassable last year for long periods of time, actually, in several spots. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Is Sweet Road on there because it gets so much traffic from the recreation folks? Not necessarily. I mean, Sweet Road's on there mainly, I think, because it's just there's not enough material to work with. There's no, there's not left a lot of gravel left on it, and okay. um, it does get substantial traffic for the hiking season. But uh, it's, it's really just a question of, we have half a dozen gravel roads we could put on the list, and yeah. So, um, with that, I'll move on to paving, or? Uh, Chris has a sure. question, go ahead. So in lieu of uh, the Bolton Pit not supplying crushed gravel this year, unless you've heard otherwise, um, I spoke to Fred McCullough the there a week, week and a half ago extensively about this particular issue because for several reasons. Um, the cost of aggregate is now going to be reasonably sub to substantially more. How does that, you know, uh, how does that eliminate our ability to do as much as we wanted to and, and what, you know, when I saw the agenda tonight <coughs> changing to roads and up, uh, update on roads and paving and stuff, I thought this conversation might be about the impacts of the fact that the Bolton Pit is closing, what's our next steps. Uh, that doesn't appear to be on tonight's agenda, uh, but it kind of the cart before the horse here, unless we've got stockpile gravel enough sufficiently for this year to do what you're talking about, um, you know, just can you elaborate a little bit on how that all impacts what we're planning yep. on? Yeah, we've had internal discussions, myself and Tom actually today, um, about that very issue. I think we worked last year's numbers up, assuming we would have a local source of gravel, but not um, <coughs> throwing out the fact that we may have to haul gravel from Heinsberg or somebody for farther, someplace further away. So, um, and as you can imagine, trucking time and costs, if before we were gonna be able to do a mile of road, perhaps under the new no gravel at Bolton, we may be doing three quarters of a mile of road or, or less, you know. Okay. Um, <laughs> again, I don't mean, to, I don't wanna go on about this, but I was hoping that we were gonna have a discussion about what it means to, to actually look at options to solve some of these mud issues. Uh, you know, we're apparently having a pass on mud season this year. It's not over with yet, uh, but uh, Bill's right. I mean, Duxbury's roads are garbage. Uh, uh, if you look at the road systems, and I've got photos and actually video, uh, of material that's being plowed off into the ditches and over the bank. That material, that's part of the reason why we don't have sufficient material on our roads. What can we do about it? Um, I've got some thoughts. Uh, I mean, it's a longer conversation than, than what's gonna happen tonight, but uh, I think it's important that we address that as soon as possible. I brought some samples of the current products that are available now hoping to talk a little bit more about it, but maybe it has to be another night. I mean, I put it up to the board. I don't know that perhaps, I mean, we're, we're, we're not hauling gravel this <coughs> week. Well, we're not spreading gravel this week. We're building roads, dirt roads this week. Um, but it's a discussion that should happen in the near future. Um, 
I specifically mainly came for paving, but um, you know, if the board wants to put it on next yeah. go around, or let's see how we do on the, your presentation, and then if there's time uh, at the end, uh, we can uh, give Chris a little bit more time to talk about uh, aggregate materials, uh, and then uh, if we need time, we can put it on the agenda for next time. Tom, did you have anything to add on? You spoke with the woman at the pit today. No, I mean, she's still selling sand. Not interested in selling, selling gravel, gravel. Or, or out of gravel. Um, and I asked her about her future plans for selling gravel, and there are none. Mm -hmm. I asked her about her future plans for selling sand beyond this year, and she said, stay tuned. Hmm. <laughs> okay. All right, so moving on to asphalt roads. Um, <coughs> in your budget, you have around 405,000 slated for asphalt roads this year or this season. Um, I think Tom directed me to come and just give you a list of options or tell you what I thought was priority. Um, I'll start off by saying we never completed the Blush Hill paving from last year. Um, a section from just beyond Lonesome Trail to the end of the asphalt, about 2,500 feet. We just put a two and a half inch base course on that road. Uh, we had a large diameter culvert that we were able to change out towards the end of the year. Um, that kind of prevented us from doing that whole road. So I would say it's imperative that we do that section of roadway as it really is just a completion of the previous year's project. Um, that was that, the culvert we put in really late in the year, right? So yeah, it was, I think, November, or, as I remember, or very late in the year, yeah. Um, which was a good choice, I think, to do it, just we, we'll have a little patching there. There was a little settling over the year, uh, but we'll top this off in that blush hill portion is going to run you probably around fifty-four thousand dollars or so of your four hundred and five you've allotted for asphalt paving. Then, in my mind, um, the next most urgent one would be Howard Avenue. Um, Howard Avenue connects Route One Hundred and Maple Street and Guptill Road and Hollow Road intersection as well. Um, I don't know how many years it's been since we've done Howard, but it's quite a long time. It's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. Bumped over it over the weekend. Yeah. So I think urgent-wise, at least, um, I think Howard is a definite uh, you know, on my list. And Do you have an estimate for that one? Yeah, that one's about 106,000 or so. Um, of course, that we can change things up a little. That depends on whether we strip the pavement ourselves or have a company reclaim the area. Um, reclaiming it would cost us a little more. If we strip it ourselves, that's just our time and normal work. Um, but it's, it's definitely in need. Um, you can see the waterline trenches from 1994, I think it was, going, you know, still visible. So um, those were the two I had as priorities. Um, and then I thought it would come down to the EFA district is in the process of trying to get a water line installed from our reservoir uh, <coughs> to the area just behind the Best Western. Uh, portions of that water line would go through uh, Ashford Lane, uh, Kennedy Drive. Uh, that's in dire need as, as well. I think if we can make the water line happen, which is still look, looking like we can, but perhaps late in the season, um, I think it would make sense to do Ashford Kennedy up there. After you put the water line in. After we put the water line in, and perhaps just do two and a half inch base course and let it settle out over the winter and, mm -hmm. and see where we are. And that water line is an EFUD bond boat. Oh, really? Yep. It'll, it's a Pretty expensive. Six hundred grand, I think, is the number we're kicking around. Um, so. So you have to have the uh, EFUD community vote on the bond before it goes forward. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that's Wednesday, May. It's either the tenth or the eleventh. Tenth. 
So the, the warning hasn't been adopted yet by the e fund board, but that'll happen this week. Can I ask a question? Sure. You said our budget for asphalt was 105? 400. 400. 405. All right. I'll let you know that question. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, wait. <laughs> All right, perfect. And do you have an estimate for the Ashford Lane Kennedy Drive portion of that? Yeah, um, that's around 150,000. Okay. And is that just the 2023 portion, or is that the total? That would be the total. And that's, that's again, assuming we can approach it different ways with reclaiming some of this, or if we can make the water line project happen, we can perhaps weasel some of that stripping of the asphalt out of the water section. You know, mm -hmm. We'll be ripping up the road and what have you. Yeah, that's right. It's all so, in them. <laughs> so there's, there's that. Um, in reality, Kennedy and Ashford and Howard are flip a coin. They're, Kennedy and Ashford's pretty bad. I don't think that's been done in 30 years. You know. Yeah, it's bad. Um, so that's, a, that's that. Um, and I, my thought is, I guess, if we did Blush and we did Howard, and you, you say yes to both those, perhaps we can get those done early season. Then if the water line is going to happen, we could do Kennedy, Ashford. If the water line's not going to happen or too late in the season, then I guess we move on to something else to pave. Um, and there's a few out there. Um, Little River's been thrown up kind of mm -hmm. in, the, in the mix. Um, Union? Union. Mm -hmm. I had somebody ask me about Union the other day. Um, there is a little portion of High Street Extension. There's going to be a housing development nine units right, the corner. right there which would be nice we've got about a hundred foot section of dirt right there that would be nice to pave if that's going to be in the village and make it easier for the highway crew to take care of that um so we can we could piecemeal in some other ones if if needed so do you have a number for a little river yep little river one hundred twenty-eight thousand. and that'd be just in that uh, settled portion of it essentially just around the past what is the last of the six or seven houses there yeah. there's a school bus turnaround right right down there and that would, we'd end it there do you, that's, a, do you have an estimate on what union would cost i didn't estimate all of union out i did um kick around the thought of milling the worst section of union which is the <coughs> up top yeah. in doing a hardy shim on that for lack of a better term that would buy us four or five more years uh, before union hopefully would have to be done yeah um but i could price out union if ashford and kennedy or little river are not options um union would most likely require some milling to keep the asphalt rate at what it is uh, with the curb line and drainage um but that could be done yes because if we do the numbers, if you're looking at Blush Hill, Howard, mm -hmm. uh, the EFUD section, and then if you add Little River, we're already above that. Yes. Yes. Not much, but. Yeah, I know. In my mind, you can't. You can do Blush and Howard. Then it's to be safe. You're either going to do Kennedy Ashford or Little mm -hmm. River. And because the price tag of both those together puts right. you over. Right. And if if there's been instructed to hit 405, not overshoot it, not undershoot it, um, if we do want Kennedy, Ashford, or Little River, we can piecemeal in with perhaps the Union Street patching that, perhaps the end of High Street and that as that housing development goes in. And nine times out of 10 every year, some bad spot develops where we just do an extensive shim or what have you. Um, yeah. Um, I've had some complaints about speeding on Little River. Mm -hmm. So I think they oh. I think they want to paved road, but I think they also want I don't know if we can put speed bumps in there. Yeah, and that would add to, to this price tag. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When you if you do that, could you do um, I don't know how you typically do it. Um, but would you just put it as part of the road or would you consider the removable type? We used the removable on 
Bidwell Lane last summer. We've used the removable on Guptal a um, couple times. Yeah, um, the removable one was free. SD Paving gave it to us, so. Just does it make your life easier to remove it in the fall? I, I think it does, yeah. I think Little River, I'm gonna guess most of the speeding traffic's during the good weather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you could certainly, with a durable one, or a portable temporary one, you still have to put up the signs and the pavement markings, technically, I think, but uh, it makes the road easier to plow if those are gone, yeah. They do make noise, though, of course, if you set the speed tables or speed bumps by the houses where they want people to slow down, they're going to have to realize there's going to be a every time somebody goes over them, so. And then there's another bump up for the trailer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. we've heard loud and clear from the residents over there about the speeding bumps. Mm -hmm. And paving that accompanied by some speed bumps, I think would, it's like we're not having deaf ears to what mm -hmm. the complaints are. If we kind of ignore, you know, Little River, I think that <coughs> I have an issue with that. Okay. You know, yeah, I want to smooth your drive real fast. Well, I'm just saying, I have some trepidation. Part, 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 <laughs> speed bumps, you know, how fast can you go? I, just, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> removable speed bumps, if they hear the sound of it, it's just the sound of safety. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then if we didn't do Little River this year, it might, I would still like to perhaps if there's money left over, do the first 300 feet of Little River. The area under the interstate bridges gets ripped up. Yeah, that's the, pretty you know, rough. That's terrible. And that, you know, but also that we have to realize they're going to be doing that bridge down there this year. Um, so the road might get marred up a little bit from that. So if, from up above? Uh, they're doing the Route 2 road, oh. but I'm just thinking equipment wise, moving in equipment in and out, whatever, mm -hmm. staging areas for whatever they do. So, um, go ahead. Alyssa? Oh, no, I was just asking, do you want formal approval tonight? <coughs> you, you could, I'll ask for Tom's direction on that. As I said, I think Blush and Howard are no brainers. Well, that's what I was just going to say. I feel like I feel comfortable with that, too. So, if, if mm -hmm. you want to make a motion to that effect, at least to them, I feel like this second part is where I'm getting into a little more complication. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. even opposition, but more it's a juggling balancing act for you. Personally, I have no reservation for my, I guess my position is, um, you know, on the on the EFUD project, we can't, you know, he's engaged the contractors working on that, but we can't tell them for sure we're hitting the go button until that bond vote passes. Um, so that sounds like it's going to be tough to get that project done and get paving done this year. But it sounds like getting the project done and, and doing some work on the road is is a more reasonable plan. So I'd rather, <coughs> so that frees up a big chunk of the budget. So I'd rather give our public works director a more clear instruction than to you know wait until October and see what happens. It'd be nice to, if it's Little River or some other road, it'd be nice to just have him know, maybe not today, but maybe in two weeks, you know, Little River this year, Ashford Kennedy next. Mm -hmm. um, just to make his life easier. He's got enough balls to juggle. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to make this a, such a motion? Question. Chris. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Two quick questions. Um, when he, didn't we turn some of Little River into dirt? Yeah. Are we rebuilding that? <coughs> okay. Yeah. Um, the reason we turned it into dirt is not to allow, or not to have, uh, have the asphalt was so bad, it, yeah. it was just made sense at that point. Second question is, uh, now that um, ST Pavement has been bought out, what's the process? Are we going to still try to work with them? I've been working with them to get the rough figures for this. I think it's a good idea to still keep working with them. Um, you know, there's always the question of if we put something out to bid, do we get a better price? Um, I think last year when we did the grant project that paved all of Stowe Street, things obviously went out to bid. SD paving was not low bidder, but they weren't out of, out of sight either. I think the bids were uh, 272,000 for the winning bid, and I think SD was 279 or something like that. So they were right in the ballpark. Um, I will say, somewhat makes my job a little easier dealing with SD paving in that 
if all of a sudden this water project happens and I, we want to juggle some stuff, they're always very accommodating. Um, yeah, which is nice. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a motion anywhere? No. I move to go ahead on the Blush Hill and Howard Street or Howard Ave projects. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Any thoughts on Blue River? Um, yeah, I, I think it'd be a good idea. I, I, from what you're saying, I don't think that we're going to be in a position to uh, pave uh, Ashford or uh, Kennedy by the end of the year. Uh, and uh, so I think that we probably can uh, get that fixed up for the winter and then put it on the agenda for uh, uh, 2024. So uh, I think it would be a good idea to add as much as Little River as is feasible this year. So I'll add that as a friendly amendment if accepted. Second. Okay. And then just a reminder for folks that, you know, we're probably lucky if paving costs year to year go up less than 5%. Even at 5%, um, we had to add 20 grand to the budget to keep pace, Yeah. Um, which is a pretty heavy lift. So we'll try to do that, but. And we see. still have, if we look at those three projects, there is a pretty, you know, it's not enough to do, you know, any of the other projects. No, but we'll, I'll spend your 405 somewhere. Yeah. I mean, that's that's not that's not there's not probably not something yeah. else that yeah, we, we could do. do the ship on, uh, on uh, Union you Street, for example. Yeah, and High Street, um, something yeah. we can. We can ship Ash Ashford to make that. We'll It'd just be a waste of time if we're going to rip, rip it up. It up yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I just know I've had a lot of calls. About yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. bad. Yeah, we should I mean, we could, it. depending on, I don't have a price. I don't think I did a Kenny <coughs> price. But essentially, most of the water line work covers Asher, very little of it on Kennedy. You could do the first 400 feet of Kennedy. Drive. We, can, we yeah. can make it happen. Yeah. Um, the only question, if we go a Little River, are we putting speed bumps or are we? I, I think it'd be. Paving them in or doing temporary, or what would you like? I'd like to um, engage some of the residents there in a conversation just to make sure they understand. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to put speed pumps in and then have calls take them out in a year. Yeah. I think they wanted to. Again, the question may be they, they were thinking speed bumps with the gravel road, not with a paved road. Mm -hmm. So, as I think Alyssa said, you know, with a paved road, people may be more apt to be driving faster and I think it's speed bumps regardless I think it's during the summer season when you have the boaters and you know the people going up to the reservoir yeah, that's and the what's big the speed, what's the speed limit on that road? 25, 25 and we asked for extra science I, would I was just going to say for the board's reference we had residents come in last year it was a pretty yeah, engaged so, discussion yeah. with regards to their need for select board at the time we went the radar enforcement method of trying to do more with the portable speed signage so i would say like i have above anything i defer to woody's expertise of you know the roads and if you think it should be paved i will completely support that um again my reservation is are we going to turn around and have them back in here and say oh my god you paved it and it's you know worse so i think yeah, so some solution with speed bumps hopefully oh mitigates that and I think not losing track of the Union and High Street Extension as someone who lives in the village and is around there, I think those folks yeah. seem to make a lot of sense. There's not that many houses. I'll make it a priority to try to engage with those folks. And okay. great. If necessary, we could invite them in for the next meeting. Mike? Our, our permanent paved speed bumps, a maintenance nightmare. <laughs> Some of the ones we have now, they're a nightmare in the fact that they changed the drainage of the road. Yeah, I, I was thinking of that, but even just then getting chunked up. Yeah, the traffic. not so so bad that I mean it's it's they're they're an issue, but yeah, uh, they do their job as a speed bump first, and you know, right. Um, I will say the ones we have on Butler Street, Randall Street, um, it's a drainage issue, is what it is. <coughs> yeah. um, and they're an ongoing maintenance issue, is in that you have to keep the line striped in front of them is a lot, a lot less than you have to worry about with a, just a straight road. So. Thanks. All right. 
We have motion uh, moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Yes, now including uh, Howard, uh, Brush Hill, and Little River. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That passes. Anything else? Um, Stem Street Center Line. Stem Street Center Line, yeah. <laughs> I feel bad. <laughs> I, know, I know he said it was the state right, got the later. Yes. Um, I just didn't know if we were bagging it entirely. No, no, it'll, it, you know, it, we're at the mercy of the state if we don't want to pay for it. Um, and if we want to pay for it, it'll probably be late in the season. Um, but uh, yes, that's still on there. We would have to pay for the white fog line that we'll be going down through at a width of ten and a half feet per lane. I can't remember. I say it's in the middle of the Yeah. Um, so that will happen. Um, and just a, we had a brief conference call today on the Main Street pole removal. Uh, the line is supposed to come down that's on the poles uh, before April 15th. And the week after that, the project should start. They think they'll be done before the 1st of June. Great. Nice. Okay. All right. Any further? Thank you. No, I'm good. Appreciate Are we not going to discuss road salt with? Oh, yeah. Road salt. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yep. Limiting road salt. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I think the damages of road salt are evident everywhere all over town. Bridges, sidewalks, curbing, everything. Um, can we limit where we spread road salt um, and still keep the public safety as an issue? Um, I think we can. I think we can do our best to, to lessen our usage. Whether we want to designate certain areas to have less road salt or whether we want to just set an overall goal of using less road salt. Um, in a lot of cases, we're at mercy of, of the weather. You know, it's, it's tough to track these things. No two winners are alike. So it's, it's tough to get a handle on our usage, especially as the price goes up. We've more or less left the bottom line. We, you know, we budgeted 60000 or whatever for road salt, yet that could be less tonnage than it was the year before. So, um, but I would say if the board wants to direct public works to use less salt in certain areas, we're, we're up for the challenge, if that's what you'd like. But are we, I know there's been numerous discussions about this issue. Uh, and some of it, do we want to consider some areas of no salt versus mm -hmm. limited salt uh, for both environmental cost issues, you know, and, and some very, very flat areas, mm -hmm. we might not be getting bang for, our, yeah. um, you know, applying any salt. I know some places, you know, I see this a lot in New York State and some other states where they have all these sections you, you see where it says no salt, and especially because all the salt goes down into these riverine areas and, mm -hmm. you know, it's a challenge because yep. people are, you know, everyone says, well, you know, they, they, they look at their own little roads and stuff like that, you know, they're off and then they go on to some road and they say, well, why aren't you applying any salt? Mm -hmm. I think some no salt, you know, and maybe that deserves some study as to exactly where we want to do that, yeah. if we're going to do a no salt. Well, as you know, uh, as, as you know, salt's only used on the asphalt roads, right. and you just added 2,500 feet of asphalt <laughs> road to us. Right, so, exactly. Um, um, but yeah, um, perhaps you want to take the approach where we look at um, Roads that are hydrologically connected to a waterway uh, right. or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And actually, Brush Hill. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was gonna. I was just gonna speak to um, as someone who has driven those New York highways with no salt during the winter time. It's miserable. <laughs> it's, it's a. Uh, it's some of those highways with with bigger turns on them, and some of the back, some of the state highways, and some of the. Um, Interstates with no salt are miserable in January to drive on. Uh, you're decreasing your speed limit 
by a considerable amount of your travel time goes through the roof. Um, I think it would behoove us to consider maybe using lesser salt in our downtown areas and with the higher speed areas, keeping our salt use where it is. Um, because if you're going 25 miles an hour anyway, you're not gonna, you know, yeah. go off the road too hard. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we do, there are certain ca cases last week when we had a little snow, it looked like the sun's gonna come out. An older woman in town complained that we were out putting uh, <laughs> salt down. And, uh, you know. You brought in. I'm going to get you back for that. You, it was the day after your birthday, so it was <laughs> <laughs> at that point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think we can, we can meet the challenge. There's times when we can use less, less salt. Yeah. So, um, I was going to actually say you can not salt in front of my house. house. There's that certain people who, who, yeah. Um, I was actually going to suggest, you know, if we think about speed limits, think about flat sections. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. If we're going to pay. Riverine areas. If we're going to yeah. pay like a little road. road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty darn flat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That might be a good candidate to just not, not ever salt. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think we've benefited over the last several years where we spent a lot of money on asphalt. The better shape your roads are, the less salt you have to use to bear them off. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's come into play over the last few years. Okay. Chris, one to the consultant. Yeah, uh, a couple of things that I witnessed over the years. I had actually proposed considering uh, <coughs> an experimental process where we eliminate salt use on the Guptill Road, except for once once you get to Thatcher Brook up to the town shed, that obviously may require salt. Uh, and Neil and Flats, and I mean even Maple Streets is flat to a board up through there um, mm -hmm. for the better part of the distance. A um, couple of things that I've noticed um, that doesn't seem to be happening is paying attention to what the weather forecast is for the day. When we have very little dustings of snow, those can be kind of slippery, um, but if a, a, a reasonable layer, not, in fact, just a dusting of sands put on that. If the sun's coming out, that sand will heat up and melt that road just as quick as salt will. Uh, but you're not poisoning the waters. Um, we don't, you know, to, to Kane's point, interstate driving is <coughs> completely different than what our roads aren't interstate roads. Maintain them, maintain them. And, it's a, and, and this whole process for me was a process of education, uh, getting people to understand that salt is detrimental to our environment, the cost is getting worse and worse all the time, uh, and that people need to start to pay attention and learn how to drive appropriately. Um, so if to, your, to Mike's point, if we could look at uh, not completely eliminating salt, but it, for the most part, to say, you know, these couple roads are pretty much off limits only when absolutely necessary. Uh, but the other part is making sure that the guys don't go ridiculous with the sand either when they when they don't need to. It's you know, it's a bigger conversation, but there's an education part on the, the highway crew as well that needs to be implemented mm -hmm. as part of this uh, process. But I do appreciate you taking this topic up because I've been after it for a long time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have a, a motion to, as a directive to the Public Works on the road salt issue? And I guess what I'd suggest is um, I personally like the idea that if we could come back to you with a plan, okay. and, and I, you know, it's hard to measure year to year, but I think a better idea is for the select board to come back, tell us to come back to you with a plan, maybe not two weeks, I mean, we've got plenty of time to work on this, right. um, which roads would go no salt or low salt, and then the other question is, um, should we engage the conservation committee and have them do a little work on this to tell us are there certain sensitive areas yeah. that we might not be thinking about? Like around Thatcher Brook on Guptill yeah. Road, for example. Chris, I agree with you, Tom. We're pretty much done with the snow. Let's all go. Yeah, that's right. Mostly done with 
the snow season, and I think this conversation is something that we could look at in a you know a few meetings okay. from that. All right. I think we could just forget even a few meetings. I think we could schedule this for September, October, and just put it on a yeah. Okay. Put it on the agenda then. Give us make give sure us time. we do it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, sounds good. And uh, Chris, I apologize, but we are a bit over no, schedule, uh, so. We can put it on another agenda. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I think we, we might want to revisit the gravel issue a little bit before September uh, because um, we will probably need to stockpile, um, or that might make sense uh, to make sure we have uh, a source of gravel of aggregate uh, going forward. Yeah. All right. Y'all set with me? Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Y'all set up. I'm going to get you back, though. <laughs> you didn't have to own that. <laughs> <laughs> All um, select board uh, liaisons. Uh, this is. Oh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Financial plan. Yeah, and so. Oh, are we in this one? I'm sorry. Yeah. Do you have one photo? No. I, don't have one, I don't have one filled out. I can, I can pass it around. Move too quickly through the agenda here. Go ahead. This is an annual requirement that we have to submit to the state, um, or we lose, in essence, base aid, which is about $100,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So the financial plan is simply our budget for mm -hmm. the year. A um, little breakdown between winter and non winter, um, and some major projects outlined. And then the certificate of compliance. Um, essentially just says that we maintain our infrastructure according to state specifications, which we always have. Mm -hmm. um, so pretty pretty perfunctory thing, but there's a fair amount of funding that hinges on it each year. All right. I will make a motion to approve the annual financial plan and certificate of compliance as presented and sign my copy of the distributed around. Thank you. Second. Okay, we have a motion moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. And this will be signing and circulating for portion or copy. All right. Now, uh, select board liaisons. Uh, this is something that uh, Tom had suggested uh, a couple of meetings ago, uh, and then uh, we talked about it briefly. Uh, the idea being that uh, uh, the select board uh, can be more effective uh, in uh, maintaining a relationship uh, with uh, the different uh, town committees and commissions uh, by having someone who is monitoring their progress, their uh, uh, goals and objectives uh, for the year and for the quarter, and uh, provide timely updates uh, to the board, and also inform those committees of any board activities that might impact uh, what's going on with them. And uh, I've had occasion to talk with uh, all members of the board uh, about where they feel they might best serve. Uh, I'll start with Mike, uh, who's had uh, considerable experience uh, in economic affairs, uh, was chair of the uh, Conservation Commission, um, and uh, has had uh, numerous other contacts throughout town. Mike, do you want to just speak to this? Yeah, I'd be, you know, I still kind of keep in touch with what stuff still, informally, that conservation being an ex-chair and you know I think I was on the Conservation Commission for eight or nine years and um, you know I, I know they're, they're a little bit struggling I know they're having a hard time with you know membership but I think that's happening with a, a lot of boards you know I have also a connection with the Friends of the Waterbury Reservoir I'm on that board mm -hmm. so I think that could be a good good connection the other part is, you know, I was on the DRB, and I'd be glad to, you know, you know, I know most of the members on the DRB, you know, and also I've been very involved in kind of revitalizing Waterbury. I, I don't know if they're looking at kind of, you know, being having a liaison 
with revitalizing Waterbury. And I know there's a number of people who express interest. You know, I have a long background in housing, but I think there are other people. Is this just for conservation? I apologize for asking a question. Well, in our conversation, we had a few different things. Okay. So it wasn't just the conservation. It was also more the economic development and, you know, you know future of the community, which I think the DRB does with a lot of future, you know, okay. then along with the planning commission, you know, mm -hmm. has a long, a lot to say about what happens in this community along the long run. So I'd be glad to help in, in any way. You know, anyone who has other interests, I'd be glad to step aside. But those are two definitely areas where I feel I can, you know, mm -hmm. you know assist. And again, I don't know where the revitalizing Waterbury, do we want to, were you looking at like something like a just for town committee. Just, just town boards. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think conservation commission is a perfect fit, uh, and uh, to the extent needed, uh, maybe DRB as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alyssa, would you like to address your uh, interests in? Uh, yes, I have to, and I apologize. I missed DRB, so I was like, oh, we're in the planning and zoning world. What happened right. quickly? Mm -hmm. um, a little different. Yeah, I guess one I would just add, I think this has been a board priority for a while. It was on the list of board goals. I think there's just in general an interest of two in part. We have various boards and committees come meet with us and there's certain things, particularly planning and zoning, shockingly to everyone, is one of my interest areas. Mm -hmm. We as the select board need to adopt those regulations and there's been instances in the past where you know the planning commission proposes regulations that in some cases don't receive select board support or don't um, or you know require amendment before that and certainly we as the board have the right to do that and want to maintain that but I think personally I would view success as having a board or committee work on a proposal that ultimately we as a select board are going to be able to support and adopt so um, I was on the planning commission prior to um, joining the select board and um, I will say the calendar year 2024 aside have generally continued to, or sorry, 2023 aside, continue to attend their meetings, so I'm certainly happy to continue there. Um, part of that also has to do with the housing overlap, but I know King is also interested in that, so I certainly mm -hmm. welcome um, support and leadership there. But I would say planning is an area of interest. I'm also happy to work on um, our and economic development and things. I know Tom said he was planning to attend those meetings, which I think is really good having been in the economic development director role, I think that direct connection with the municipal manager is really effective. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, uh, King. Um, as Alyssa said, yeah, housing is definitely the big one for me. Um, we had spoken about <coughs> charters on our agenda now anyway, so I think I can skip over that for now, but yes, housing is the big one and I would like to focus on for okay. sure. Within the housing task force? Um, I would like to, to focus my energy at least outside of everything else in, house, in the housing task force to focus on short term rentals and what we can and cannot do uh, regarding those. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think we have heard quite a bit about uh, short-term housing and its impact uh, on the overall uh, rental market uh, in Waterbury. So uh, I think uh, that would make uh, good use of your energies and interests uh, if you could serve in that capacity and uh, potentially get back to us with some of your findings <coughs> about what uh, maybe other towns have done uh, in terms of short-term rentals uh, and any recommendations that uh, you think the select board should consider. Absolutely. So I'm sorry, he, Kane's going to be the liaison for the housing task force, though? Is that, did I understand that right? Yeah. Uh, um, Alyssa has been that person. I think uh, she'll continue. I don't know, you, you speak for yourself. But she's a member of the task force. Right. right. But we'll, we'll also assign uh, Kane to the task force uh, with sort of special interest in short-term rentals. Great. And then I spoke uh, with Danny, uh, and uh, we're both interested uh, in uh, uh, recreation. Uh, I said that uh, 
in the short term, I would take the lead on that, uh, and that uh, she could uh, also back me up uh, as needed. Um, and to the extent that we uh, need to have a direct liaison uh, with EFED, uh, both of us are also interested in serving in that capacity. And I don't know if we need to make a formal vote on this, but uh, those are our interests. Uh, Tom, do you think there's a need for uh, um, to make this official? Okay. No, I think that's official as we need to be. For the purpose of my minutes, can mm -hmm. you please just define what your expectations of the liaison is? Because I don't believe I have that captured anywhere. Nor have we discussed it, so I uh, didn't know what I was going to say. So it does not, I don't, you don't have to go into great detail, but I made, you know, Mike is the liaison for the conservation, Alyssa's planning, Kane is housing, and CLAP is recreation. What's your responsibility? Mm -hmm. um, I guess from my perspective, uh, what I'd say is that uh, it's a, uh, provides uh, an avenue of communication to communicate the interests of the select board and also to bring the interests and uh, priorities of those commissions and committees back to the select board and uh, try to, to clarify uh, particular objectives uh, and uh, goals for this, uh, this calendar year. Okay, because also what's not on the list then is the Development Review Board and the Tree Committee, the only other two board appointed. Um, mm -hmm. and I kind of mentioned boards. that I would consider, especially being a former member of the DRB. Yes, I, yes, you and Alyssa both, I believe, said that, but I, right. am I, are we? Oh, you could write DRB next to Mike, I think was our intent. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's how I understood it. Sorry, okay. that was I did not. confused. I did not, so okay. Um, All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah, and the uh, tree committee, um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know that we want to solve all the issues right now, but uh, we can see uh, what would make most sense uh, for the tree committee going forward. Okay. Sounds good. All right. I apologize that we're going a bit uh, over time on the agenda, uh, but if we're ready to move forward, um, I'll ask uh, Scott to come forward and uh, talk to us about the um, Little League Parade. Good evening, everybody. So you'll have to just thumb through the packet to find his stuff yeah. then. They're, they were in a different order. Was that the maps like with the hand drawn? Oh, yes. 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 Don't be picking on my stick pig. Oh, I love them. Because this is the cover that I was a big fan of the stick figures. <laughs> and the well, so the last time we met, we discussed making plans and yeah, oh, going you. and, and having discussion regarding the parade from the Dacro Field south down to Park on the State Drive. Um, it had been done in years past. I know we have other functions that try to, you know, parade down the main street or snow or what it's going to be. So what I did was I took my years of experience sitting in UNMUTCD for the state of Vermont. So I spent 31 years doing safety for them, and I'm spending five years doing some more for a private entity. And these are what I came up with for a, a mock plan to, uh, to get us from the Dak Row 47 North Main to State Drive um, using some, uh, some assets that I have, some assets that I've looked for, and uh, alternative routes. So the first thing I did is I took, uh, I took this plan, put it into place, and I sent it to uh, Chief Dillon and said, shoot holes in it. Let me know what you come up with. He said, looks good, can't find anything, and you left it functional enough so emergency situations can be adjusted. So to me, that was win number one. So win number two was sending it to Tom and, and you guys to make sure you could have some time to look at it instead of me just coming in here and you know, showing you slides and little stick figure pictures and columns. That's not the way I want to do things. So this is what we had derived. Um, it's a half mile. I've walked it several times. Um, I've met with... Uh, with members of the town, and I also met with, uh, well, I got the uh, ENS Transport, who's a record service here. They're going to do blockers in the back. Uh, the fire department is uh, willing to give us some coverage. I spoke to Sergeant Werner from uh, VSP, and he is willing to give us a lead car. And right now, our numbers are sky high. 
with, we've averaged probably 80 kids a year for the last three or four years, not, you know, pandemic-wise. It's, it's hard to say that's good or bad, but uh, we're up to about 135 kids right now. Yeah, that's nice. And we still got two weeks to go. So it's, I got a lot of community support, banners, and I just, like I said, I want to make sure we do this right and kind of build a report now so if we do it in years, years to come as well as, you know, other groups that come through here, we'll do the same thing and follow some type of template. So we know we're protecting not only the people that are in the road, but you know our interests as a town owners and managers and you know and property owners and all that good stuff. So mm -hmm. this is what I had. I hope you guys had some time to review it and you know love the before any questions you guys have. Yeah, I just want to thank you for uh, taking this seriously, uh, taking the time to meet with uh, the uh, chief of uh, both the fire department and uh, our uh, state police contacts. Uh, developing a plan that uh, allows for alternative passage of uh, traffic uh, and uh, addressing uh, all the issues that were brought up previously. Any other comments from the board? How long are we going to take them to get through? You know, I'm just in, in time. In my, email, <laughs> in my email slash report that I sent you guys, I figured about 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. yes, that, that's the little legs, of course. So. I think, it, you know, we could probably do it 35, but I think if we, we cut the traffic back at 10 of 12 or 10 of 1, like we were talking, um, get everybody ready. Um, I set up a, a, a TA, a typical application through MUTCD, which follows traffic north to south. The blocker vehicles are to keep people at bay behind, you know, the parade as they go. So, example, when we leave here, there'll be blockers at the... Uh, you know, at the crosswalk, so Union Street will be by alternate route out down through, you know, into Pilgrim Park. And then once we leave there, those backer vehicles will follow the parade and everybody can follow behind them if they see fit. So Winooski Street will be the first closure. We get by Winooski Street, people can take south, head up 100, or they can continue to follow them down through. And we open the roads up as we go. Mm -hmm. There's no sense of keeping them blocked for an entire hour. On a Saturday, it's going to be total chaos. My, uh, my biggest take back was the four-way intersection at Park Row, so park him south. And I said to Gary, I said, I think that's where the, the fire department would be best suited because we would have a couple of vehicles down there. And then with my extensive experience and a couple more vehicles with lights, I'm more than happy to assist if they need to leave for an emergency response. Mm -hmm. So I think, in the, and I have a meeting with the Sons of the American Legion tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, and I'm going to look for their support to uh, come and help us with the uh, traffic control. And the northbound traffic would be able to take a right on um, Park Row and then uh, follow Railroad and Union Street Correct. to get back to the traffic circle? And then anybody from Bidwell will be able to come up over Stowe down and make their way through. And we'll have uh, full closure on the, on the dry bridge side on Stowe Street and then a partial on where Union and Railroad are mm -hmm. so we can get people in and out. Okay. And there'll be no vehicles parked anywhere left unattended like you know we have had in the past and I know that was a concern and we'll make sure that those are, are taken care of. Um, mm -hmm. There will be a cell phone and radio response for everybody if there's an issue. Um, I'll be in direct contact with everybody and we'll make sure that we coordinate it as it goes. Cool. Great. Good job. Thank you. Yeah, this is really well done. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have a motion? I make a motion to approve the plan for the uh, Little League Parade. Thank you. I haven't worn my baseball hat. Oh, oh, look at that. Yeah, yeah. Opening day. Yeah. Beautiful. That's, that's a Yankees hat, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, that's a baseball hat. Oh, it, 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 it is what it is. So. I second the motion. Okay, we have a motion moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. Good luck to the kids. And then what I'll, do is, and what I'll do is a courtesy back to the board and the town. I will make sure that I have my full report and set up in place, let you know who's going to be here, contact names, so that way if we need to uh, make contact after the fact, you will know how to do this. We expect Good. them to make an appearance in the World, world Series. I, I expect them to uh, to come down and have a good time playing the ball. That's the most important. They're not painting uh, buildings and breaking windows and having a good time. <laughs> Don't get my ideas. <laughs> right. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, Scott. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Scott. Yep.
Uh, next up is the Leaf Peoples Race, half marathon and 5K run, scheduled for October 1. Do we have anyone to uh, address this? I guess not. Well, this is you know, yeah. probably not uh, have to be done uh, right today, but uh, it's before us, so let's take a look. Um, yeah, I appreciate the fact that it's so late in the fall, but this, this organization was actually one of the first ones to reach out to me. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they've been waiting probably longer than anybody else to get an answer. Mm -hmm. um, and they've, I think, got a pretty reasonable safety plan they've had in the past. And then a fair amount of this is not in Waterbury. It's all we've yeah. heard about yeah. during all this, this event. And it's never been a problem. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, so a lot of this uh, takes place in Duxbury. Um, and then, uh, a lot of Gary's concern with the little league I thought was just the amount of people in a, and closing the, closing the road and getting emergency vehicles through. I don't think he shared that concern with, with this or the gravel grinder at all. And that was my question all the time. It was more just like how I have kids. Do we have to be in communication with the town of Duxbury for security and fire protection? We provide Duxbury's fire as a matter of course currently. They're contract with us. So that would be one of the same. Okay. Well, then that answers that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they don't, there is no complete road closure for this uh, event, if I understand it. So it uh, would allow for the passage of emergency vehicles under any condition. Um, and it's been running for several years. Uh, there have been concerns, mostly on the Duxbury side, as I understand it. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Karen or Tom, if you've any particular concerns about this? No. No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other issues from the board? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve the uh, plan for the Leaf Keepers Half Marathon and 5K run on Sunday, October the 1st. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Peepers Half Marathon and 5K Run uh, application is approved. Next up, we have uh, the uh, 100 on 100 race. It's a, um, an event uh, to be run on Saturday, August 12th, uh, 2023. Again, this is a race that's been run for several years through Waterbury, starting in Strand, ending up uh, at Okimo. Uh, again, it doesn't require any complete road closures. It just crosses through town. Uh, and... Uh, goes through, we're fairly close to the beginning of the race, so in my experience it goes through town fairly quickly. Uh, I'm uh, glad to hear any concerns or issues that uh, someone like to bring to our attention. I don't have any concerns, but do we know how many participants are in this? Yeah, that's a good question. Mm, that's a good question. I don't think it's you. We have teams of six Six members per team, and uh, I'm going to guess that there are maybe 20 teams. Last I remember, uh, my wife participated in it a couple of times. Um, I can. I, mean, I don't know if it'll make a difference in your telling them they can do it, but it's certainly something I can ask for just for to memorialize how many. Yeah. 
I don't think yeah. if it's what Roger said that small. You know, I was. More, I don't think it's going to be like a thousand people. Yeah. And that might change some. No. Uh, well, and it's also uh, it's Rose uh, Relay, so they have uh, there. There's actually a uh, handoff. In the, in the town of Waterbury, I think, between the second and the third runner. Uh, so you only have one person of the six running at a time, and the rest uh, travel in a van to, oh, to the next checkpoint. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. So uh, in my experience, it's, uh, it's not a big, uh, it doesn't have a huge impact on the town, uh, or circulation or, or anything. I'll entertain a motion. Oh, it's Chris. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that 100 on 100 road race, mm -hmm. that does affect a lot of Route 100 when it comes to the, the weekend traffic. Mm -hmm. So every one of those lead cars have every participant that's in them, mm -hmm. plus everybody who is rooting the cruise on. So when you come rolling down Route 100, every pull-off, turn-off, side street, driveway, business mm -hmm. is packed full of people. Mm -hmm. And okay. they're in the middle of the road. They're up against the road. They're mm -hmm. doing just about whatever they feel fit to do. Mm -hmm. So whether that's considered to me a safety concern, I would say yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I understand it brings revenue into the town. So on, it's, it, it may be it may, it's any kind of work at Bill and Bubble during the week. Right. right. And on Saturday, it's anywhere from three to five hours where we just have nothing but total chaos inside this the yard and the hardware store next door and everybody would just park in where they want to be, where they, you know, where they're gonna go, running back and forth across the streets. So there is a little bit of concern for me in regards to traffic safety that these types of things are, are looked at and make sure that there's some set in rules when it comes to the traveling public at the same time. Mm -hmm. Is that also the same weekend as the car show? I haven't gotten information yet from the but car that's show. That's about when the car <laughs> show usually yeah. happens. So, and that's when they have their parade going around town. So. Like I said, I think it's a great event. I just want to make right. sure mm -hmm. that we realize that yeah. there's not just people running down the side of Route 100. There's also numerous vehicles and attendees and, and fans and family that are following and chasing. and. You know, their cars are all marked up with paint and balloons, and it's just, it's a, it's a festival coming down to 100. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when it gets by us, it's probably the same issue from every town from, you know, Waterbury to Akimo. But definitely something that should be, you know, that should be thought about and maybe, maybe present them with a, you know, with a scenario of making you a traffic control plan coming through the town of Waterbury about how they're going to mitigate some of that, some of that stuff. Whether other towns are going to follow it when they get out of our, you know, our boundary part of it. That's not up to us to make up. I just would really hate to see somebody get hit. And Leaf Fever actually put it in. It's a much smaller race, but one of their bullets, Leaf Fever is, is that runners will be notified on race day and pre-race information that spectators are not to travel by vehicle onto the race course. Obviously, it's different because there are a number, but they, you know, call it out as we're going to try our best. I think yeah. we're in the process now where we're going to start trying to form, uh, formalize yeah. and get a standard way of doing these things like the, the league program parade, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, and I think that we should look at that at the same time just to make sure that we uh, kind of follow a, a kind of the same role model plan to make sure that it's easier to devise and put together. <coughs> The car show is that weekend. Mm. That's what I thought because I know when the car shows, it's usually it's not at the very minute. beginning of August, and the next weekend sounds like it'll be this weekend. Yeah. So uh, perhaps we should respond to them and say that, uh, that there is another event uh, happening that was also going to impact traffic and that we'd like. Uh, some further specifications on how they're going to uh, address uh, safety concerns. Uh, you want me to just ask them for a safety plan? Yes. Yeah. And we can yeah. even say we've heard some concerns regarding, in particular, not just those running the race, but those watching <laughs> and spectating and impacts. And mm -hmm. do they have a plan and what information do they communicate? Yeah, like I said, don't get me wrong, it's a great community event. It is well, that, that one incident is going to tarnish it forever. So. Mm -hmm. I can, I can but it's not going to be that part of the reason for that. I was like, I was like yeah. Happens, you know? I can I check in with our state troopers and we'll approve it. But see if they're available. 
Should we be coordinating this with the folks from the car show? I know the car show, has they, have they asked for a permit yet? No. Probably not. But the, uh, I, I think the timing is a little bit different. Uh, this usually starts in the morning, uh, the mid-morning. The, right, the car show parade percent. is usually around 3, 3.30. Exactly. And these guys are long gone by then. But uh, we can get uh, maybe more information about the timing of this race, number of people involved, and how they're going to address uh, some of the issues that Scott brought up uh, about uh, safety on Route 100. Yeah. All right. Uh, and we'll leave this pending until we get for more information. Is that okay? Right. Um, and then the uh, last one will be the gravel grinder. Circus, circus. Oh, I'm sorry, circus, circus, first. Circus, circus. Now, I think that when I sent you the PDF by email, if you had an opportunity to look mm -hmm. at it, it was something like 35 pages long. Yeah, it was I did great. not print that version for you tonight. Um, you. I just printed, you know, a couple of the um, the cover sheets and and the tent sketch mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, so anyway, just so you know that there was more information in the email than than what I printed here. But this will be uh, fully contained over on uh, Forest Field. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be over uh, the Fourth of July weekend. Uh, our own not quite Independence Day parade will be the previous weekend, uh, so there won't be any particular conflict there. Um, Circus Marcus has been active uh, in the state for know, well over 30 years or so. Uh, but yeah, I believe it's the first time they've set up uh, over at Forest Field, is that right? Uh, yeah, this is the first time we've ever had a request for them here. Yeah. Um, they did ask me questions such as whether the town requires them to have an EMT there. Apparently, some towns do require such things. We didn't have, we didn't have anything like that uh, stipulated anywhere. Um, but it looks like they have some safety compliance already in place anyway. Um, and it does sound like, in my emails back and forth with this woman, Michelle, it does sound like they want to make this an annual event. Mm -hmm. So. Did they have an event on Fourth of July? someplace else that they've lost or? I don't know. Uh, they, they do change their schedule a little bit uh, year to year. Uh, I know they set up uh, in Montpelier uh, there for, for several years in a row, so maybe that is uh, the change schedule. That's why I thought they were in Montpelier for, for the 4th of July. Right. So maybe for whatever reason they're not, right. they can't, uh, can't do Montpelier or they just uh, discovered that Waterbury is a much better community than Montpelier is. So. <laughs> I think we would all agree. <laughs> so, so unlike yeah. many of the other ones, this particular one, there is an entertainment ordinance that applied to them. It was very specific in the ordinance. I apologize, I didn't bring one. But it was very specifically listed circus. Um, so I did send them this entertainment permit yeah. Which requires not your signatures, but just an invitation that it was approved or denied in a twenty-five dollar fee. Okay, so it's a yeah. um, so okay. she filled that out and signed it and said she would add it to her packet for next year, which is when I was aware she'd be coming back next year. So. Yeah. Um. I mean, we, we have an ambulance service uh, in town. Uh, I would think that if there was, was an emergency, uh, they're within fairly easy uh, distance of uh, getting those services uh, as needed. Mm -hmm. um, you can talk to them about uh, they want to have a presence there on right. a volunteer basis. Okay. Yeah. Um, any other? Concerns or issues that uh, the board would like to bring up? Um, I lived in Montpelier for a few years while they were doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, like, the town essentially filled up with people going to restaurants, doing their thing, and then they'd go to the Smirkus thing, or they'd go to the restaurants after the Smirkus thing. And 
from a local business standpoint, I think it would be a really good bring in for Waterbury. Mm -hmm. Okay. Economic development. Her note is actually right on this cover page. Does Waterbury require police, fire, and EMT details to be present during the shows? What are your requirements for the number of police and fire officers per 750 people? Again, there was nothing for me to use uh, a, as a historical document to answer that question. No. Um, but if you have anything that you, any of the board wishes to relay to her, then we has, can. has Chief Dillon reviewed any of this? I don't know. I, I believe I included Gary on an email when I first received this back in <coughs> February, but I didn't ever have a specific conversation with Gary about because about this event. Because all this tent, you know, these large tents, mm -hmm. you know, I remember uh, I wasn't involved with it, but in Iowa Mont, where they had a big storm and tent came down, mm -hmm. three mm -hmm. people were killed. and mm. So I don't know enough about that. I don't know yeah. enough about that stuff. And I think <laughs> someone like Gary, you know, yeah, they do have to get a state. They have to get a state division of fire safety right. permit. I mean, she says yeah, that they that's have. Right. That's they have actually in their safety plan. Yeah. Like Twenty-one hour winds. They evacuate the tent. Right. They have a list of things, but I think we should get an opinion from Chief yeah. Dillon on, you know, a lot of what they have presented to us. Is I, I'll say I'm not an expert in, in these areas, you know, where I think Gary could do a much better job. Mm -hmm. Um, then could we uh, direct uh, Chief Dillon to, to review this and then uh, be ready to uh, uh, look at this uh, for approval in the, uh, the following meeting? Two weeks? Yep. Okay. So we're going to tell them that we do have an entertainment permit. She's, she's already filled it out. Yeah. Oh, okay. She's, this, she's, I've got it attached to your documents there. I, said, I would just say my overall takeaway, I think this is excellent. The point has already been raised, but just to say again, this is why a checklist is great. We don't have a noise ordinance. There isn't a noise permit. Right. They have to meet the state ordinance, hyperlinked to the state noise ordinance. It's 10 p.m. There's a decibel amount. Gathering permit is attached. Thanks for filling it out. And no, we don't require police fire and EMT. If that's a policy change we want to make, exactly. we should make that. And that mm -hmm. folks know it. Two weeks, sounds great. Um, I'm going to propose, I was like, and in particular, there's time on this one. Gravel Grinder is a closer date, so I'll see. Right. Uh, <clears throat> um, let's uh, now take a look at the Gravel Grinder. Um, okay. mm -hmm. Our, um, I spoke to a trooper report about this, and he's free that day to work this event. Okay. So That'll be helpful. I know uh, people have expressed concerns about people re riding two and three and maybe even four abreast. Uh, it says in here that they're going to enforce the single file rule. Um, but uh, I guess to date, <laughs> maybe that has not been respected. Uh, I think a, a force uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's not really a race, it's more of a social event, and um, people uh, do ride for a bus. I've seen it myself. Uh, so I think that we, we will need to call attention to that. Uh, any other concerns that uh, the board would like to bring to our attention? I've got one. I'm a, yeah. I'm a Perry Hill resident. I live on Culver Road. Right. And in past years, we never even knew that this was even going on. Mm -hmm. And the four and five abreast is, is definitely impedes anything that people come in. And we've even had um, cars in our, in our end of our driveways that would not allow us to leave our homes while mm -hmm. these vehicles, while these bicycles were pedaling up Perry Hill. Mm -hmm. So it's windy. It's, you know, it's a, it's a good grade from, from Culver Road where I live down to Stoke Street. And somebody, like I said, is, is really, and I've never seen police presence up there in a number of years that this event has been going on. So, mm -hmm. no signage, and not even to talk about garbage. So, there's another one too, water bottles, you name it. Mm -hmm. From there to the trailhead where they, where they veer off, I spend, you know, countless times as well as everybody else I'm doing green up day picking up plastic water bottles, papers, all kinds of stuff. So it's like, uh, once again, it's, another, it's a great event, you know, but you have residents there who, A, have to get 
you know, from point A to point B on the day that it happens, um, post in a time, and keeping it available for emergency services to be able to get in and out of there if somebody out there has an event is pretty important. Mm -hmm. So that was some of the points that I wanted to touch, and I actually spoke with Karen about this a couple of weekends ago at uh, open session for, for uh, baseball. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it's, it's one of those things, good event, it you know, brings stuff into the community again, but just some of those things we need to highlight where, you know, if and when the accident occurs, I would really not want to be the one on the receiving end of how come these types of things aren't being completed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, it seems as though maybe some of those issues have been brought to their attention because they do talk yes. about uh, the uh, roads being posted and that, uh, notification being made uh, in front porch forum and uh, other uh, public forums um, and uh, Tom, uh, I guess a quick question for a green update coordinator it's <laughs> green update may 6th so if there's a littering issue on may 7th from this ride it'll be pretty visible the day after green up i'm the green up coordinator um, the day after green up i go out and i drive pretty much every road in town mm -hmm. and I continue to pick up and I flag things and I often am picking up signs from the gravel grinder um, thing or I'm letting them know where they are. I communicate with them afterwards because they, they try to pick up their signs but they inevitably leave some around. Um, so yeah, we, we're aware of it. Okay. And I actually had to call the event coordinator one year to tell them to come pick up the broken folded table they left at the bottom of my driveway. Hmm. So. Like I said, once again, not, not complaining, it just, mm -hmm. you know, if we're going to do this, let's do it in a professional fashion and, you know, everybody's going to have a good time with it. Okay. The residents shouldn't have to, you know, pay the burden of having to deal with trash and traffic and, you know, emergency issues that may or may not come up during this event. Where does it say right. to ride so I like, I don't know why I can't well, find it. Oh, that's on, I just saw it. The riders will be involved the riders will go out of there. Right. Under last bullet under pre-event safety on Tuesday. Right. I guess I think I miss is that if we highlight uh, the, the issues that uh, Scott and others have signaled, uh, that uh, you know we, we they need to make sure that uh, the single file. Uh, rules are ab uh, abided by and that uh, they put an extra effort into uh, patrolling uh, the, the event and cleaning up afterwards. Uh, I think uh, I, I'm feeling favorably disposed to uh, letting this go forward, uh, but open to further discussion. I think they have to have more people monitoring the course, as Scott said. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, there's not a, a lot of following that single file, and unless you have enough people out on the course, you know, that basically says if you don't do that, you're going to be eliminated from the race. So, as I think people have said, this is is more of a social kind of event than it is almost a, a race. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm fa favorable for events like this happening, but they have to also have the appropriate volunteer staff to police the event, and I think that's lacking, especially in this event. Okay. Uh, do you want to put that in the form of a motion? I'd make a motion. I would agree to permit the uh, Waterbury Area Trails Alliance uh, to have the, their 2023 gravel grinder with the express condition that the organizing staff provide appropriate um, volunteers to have a safe event. I'll second with the friendly amendment. It's all volunteers, they don't have a staff. 
and that we also get a day of contact and phone number. I appreciate the organizations that provide that. Your amendments for a friend. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. Uh, um, we have a motion that's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, we have approval of this with the conditions uh, stated in the motion. I'm sorry. Alyssa, you wanted contact information? Is that what you said? Yeah, just can we get a race day contact with phone number? Honestly, I would, well, we know we didn't include the 100 on 100. I would ask the same about 100 on 100. Okay. I probably, I mean, I probably have numbers. that on the emails, right? Okay. Yeah. Is my guess. Is I see if there's a form, we could just be on the form yeah. of who to call the day of. Boy, you know, it's not phone numbers. No, I'm, I'm suggesting that maybe on this yeah, particular yeah, one, I probably it's didn't have to. I got you. But so I mean, just asking. Like, I just wanted to capture it. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who's the so the phone will be high and a little bit uh, sidetracked a little bit, maybe, and the uh, rose and well, paper, but whatever. Well, and that was an ambitious 25 minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Want me to give a quick intro? Yeah. Well, I'll have Tom give a quick yeah, intro. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you. Uh, Tom is going to just give us a quick orientation on the tree warden position, and uh, then we can move on to uh, talk with the candidate. So, Steve has been. Yeah, Steve Lochby uh, retiring, it leaves a pretty big void. Um, and so what I'm hoping to do is step in a little bit and help him out. Um, tree warden, there's a possibility we could have a deputy tree warden, uh, perhaps uh, Celia or somebody that works in for the town. You know, as our community grows, um, more people are moving into the area. Trees are in the way of public places. Um, we can drive better volunteers by having a plan. Um, and basically that's what my job is. And, you know, Steve's not retiring right away. He's still going to be part of the program, but, um, you know, I run a, a landscape company right now. Uh, the town uh, contracts me for quite a bit, um, in terms of, uh, the roundabout, the flower baskets, um, the Christmas garlands. I get tons of feedback from the town quite a bit. And I've had a lot of opportunity to meet some of the community members of the town. Um, and we've got some uh, pesticides and some issues and some uh, things that uh, require a little bit more expertise. And by having a tree committee, I've been on the tree committee for about a year and a half. And just being a, a good communicator between um, myself and the town officials, I um, hope that could be a, um, something that I can bring to the table. Tom, that's about it. Is there anything specific you want me to go into? I know we have we put together a tree care ordinance. I don't know if folks have reviewed that. Um, um, I don't have the ordinance in front of me. Uh, but Steve, how do we pronounce your last name? It's Mike. I'm oh, sorry, Mike. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> yeah, okay. Both first names. <laughs> Mike, Lo Shiaba. Lo Shiaba. good. Um, great, well thank you for that. Uh, Tom, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, um, we should at some point consider a deputy. We haven't had one in the past. Uh, it could be Bill Woodruff, could be Celia in Public Works. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, I'd say the my experience, um, you don't run into a lot of thorny issues once you're out of downtown, really. Um, we are, for example, treating some ash trees in downtown, some older big ashes with uh, there's some chemical treatment to hopefully make them less, uh, make, give them some resistance to a more dashboard. Uh, you, you sometimes run yeah. off thorny issues. Um, a great example is the sidewalk projects that we're working on every year. Um, you reduce sidewalks, you oftentimes kill tree roots. The tree warden sometimes will need to make a call about whether or not we take down that tree or not, try to work with the homeowner in those instances. Um, sometimes it's easy and the homeowner um, 
doesn't particularly care what you do with the tree. Sometimes the homeowner really wants you to try to save the tree. So, some, so the tree warden knows it and says, um, helps on navigating those issues. Yep. And you can also uh, be a good communicator to give notification if the tree is going to potentially be cut down, whether or not one sided. Um, so it's just more communication. Yep. Great. Any other comments or questions from the board? Yeah, Mike. Just curious, Mike, if, if, if you know, like if we have like a storm like, you know, we had with Irene, granted we didn't have as much down trees, but does the tree warden do that? And maybe Tom can answer that too. If there are a bunch of trees down, do you make the call on what trees get taken out or if there are hazards? Well, I can step, I can step in, Tom. It's, uh, uh, is the spectrum, I mean, if it's a very big storm and there's, you know, really maybe multiple crews that need to be put out to do the repair work, um, they don't necessarily need the tree warden to look out for it. But maybe if we have a, a 95 year old um, elm that's being considered uh, taken down, um, you know, on those one off scenarios is, is probably where the, where the tree. And I don't think I need to be involved in every one off, but, you know, taking feedback from the community and passing it on to you guys or whoever the deputy tree warden would be would be that. I'm just I don't looking, know if you want to add to that, Yeah, I'm just looking at last week's, like in the Midwest, all the uh, damage that was caused by the tornadoes. Not well, well, hopefully not going to have a tornado. Yeah, it doesn't here. happen here. No. Well, Mike, like, you know, climate change is important, and um, it just is what it is. Uh, well, Mike, thanks for stepping forward and thanks for the update uh, and your experience uh, with this. Sounds like a good match to me. Uh, does anyone on the board wish to make a motion? Um, Alyssa. To appoint Mike Luciano as tree warden with thanks for his service. Thank you. You're welcome. Friendly amendment to that. that uh, if you, if you uh, second it first. Okay, I okay. second it. But a friendly amendment would be to add Bill Woodruff as deputy tree warden. If Have we asked Woody? That was I said I was open to that <laughs> if Woody was <laughs> insulted. I'm not appointing Woody to anything without his explicit <laughs> consent. Upon his cons consent. <laughs> so he his, his, uh, he his his consent. Other duties as assigned. Okay. On his consent. He might Celia might prefer to be in that role. I haven't had a chance to talk with her about that. So yet. let's wait and just okay. do Mike. We'll just do Mike then. Okay. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor of appointing Mike Lashago uh, as our new tree warden, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Mike, congratulations. Are you related to the guy on TV who does cars? I am. He's my uncle. Yeah. Okay. I, I thought with that name it had to be. There we go. There you go. We have a celebrity. Um, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the sorry for the delay. Moving on, appointment of the Central Vermont uh, Regional Planning Commission representative. So with Steve's retirement, uh, so the first off, the town gets an appointment to CVRPC. Um, CVRPC has a pretty big role. Um, there is. And part of it is they have a role in endorsing our own municipal plan. Um, CVRBC is, um, has also a role in um, more mundane things. For instance, grant applications we submit, they will oftentimes submit a letter of support confirming it comports with the regional plan. Mm -hmm. um, your appointment does not have to be a town staff person. Um, so you might want to think about this one a little bit. Um, traditionally, it's been Steve. It could be Steve's replacement. You can sit on it for a little bit. You don't have to make any, any recommendation today. You can think about this, and, and we can bring it up in a few weeks. Um, I'm a little leery about making Steve Steve's ultimate replacement the appointee, just because that person will be new, and I'm going to put too much on their plate. So I, I guess I encourage you to find someone other than that person. Mm -hmm. I agree. And is Steve not serving, uh, opting not to serve again? Okay. 
And we don't have any other candidates stepping July, forward. Through July, yeah, June 30th. She going to start. Uh, to be clear, I don't think yeah. we've advertised that. This we have not advertised. So, that. as point of reference, so being a planning disease, there's this. We can also have an alternate. Um, but I see our draft agenda that we're discussing later. I mean, it might be too soon for that, but I would propose we advertise it. Okay, we can do that. Yes. I'm willing to do it candidly, but I'm not trying to just appoint myself to go to more planning meetings. <laughs> and that's what I'm willing to do it if we don't find anyone else. It'd be nice to see if there's interest by a member of the community who I has agree. interest in that. Mm -hmm. Great. And some experience, we would hope. Or to go hand in hand. <laughs> well, if you look ahead at that draft agenda, right. you're going to see that there's um, one, two, three, four applicants right now for one seat on the planning commission so maybe some of them have an interest great okay um, okay so i can do an ad uh, for the cbrpc on with lisa and uh i'm from Porch forum and sort of mirroring the way that i put out word for these volunteers that sounds good okay Thank you. okay Yes, we need no further action on that. Um, the schedule of fees for the steel room. It has been $25 uh, since it was uh, first constructed, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. Who pays other than, I know town, town boards and commissions, I'm sure, don't pay. But like, does a historical society pay what they use this room? No, mm -hmm. not, not internal town agencies. Okay. Like revitalizing Waterbury and such. They pay. They, they pay. Mm -hmm. So non non municipal uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. maybe the historical society is a stretch, but they occupy the building, so right. they've never paid. RW has <coughs> paid. The yeah. state yeah. pays. Yes. To answer to the answer the question, anybody, everybody pays. Yeah. yeah. We <laughs> don't we don't waive the fee for anybody, whether you're nonprofit or. So Tom lights his best friend. You pay. <laughs> I, don't know, like, I think it might want to be somewhat time. -based. I don't have any if someone's going to have a room here for you know, old a day, you know, a to this full job. day thing, I think they should pay more than twenty-five dollars. Yeah. Okay, so I'm sorry. Let me go over the fee structure. It's twenty-five dollars for the first two hours. It's ten dollars an hour after that. So okay. all told, it's like eighty-five dollars to use this room for a for, whole day, for a day, which. You know, you have obviously access to this room and the IT equipment, not the owl. You have you have access to the kitchen. <coughs> People have caterers. There's restrooms outside. I think m more than all that is that inevitably the staff get sucked into the meeting in some way. Whether right. it's we need more tables, we can't F hear anything. Projector. Yeah, inevitably staff time is used um, and. And staff time, cleaning staff. Yeah, cleaning oh, yeah. staff. Yeah, yeah. Trash is left, which it's not that big a deal, but we don't have a dumpster here or anything, so staff ends up taking that downstairs. Just all those little things that mm -hmm. go with it. The fees are probably not paying the costs involved. But. Um, I don't know. Tom had time. I pulled together 2021. Um, so in all this room, Gardner maybe $1,200 in rental fees right. in 2021. Um, which is, was probably really a low year because it, this, fee, this room didn't get used at all through COVID yeah, and it was right. just kind of barely coming yeah. back in 2021. It's going to start ramping up this year. Yeah, so we've already seen, which is what we brought on this staff conversation because we're already seeing a big increase in requests in 2022. Mm -hmm. so. uh, do we have a recommendation from the staff? <coughs> Did you have a recommendation? Yeah, 50 bucks for the first two hours. Mm -hmm. Keep the $10 an hour after that. So just increase the first two, yeah. Deanna did me a great service today and found some other rooms available. I mean, the, the prices range all over the place. Right. Um, but um, none of them are quite as cheap as this. Yeah, it, it seems way. to me like this is the best deal in town. Yeah. It is. The fish and game, I think they get like for a day, like, Oh, it's like four hundred dollars, but like for nonprofits, I think they're like two or two fifty. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot more expensive this is, than this. So, you know, this should be a community resource, right. but 
you know, I think it's being given yeah. away a lot too cheap yeah. now. So, maybe uh, to start with, uh, if we would accept the recommendation of the town manager uh, as so avoid sticker shock, but also uh, recognize that we're a little bit uh, out of the loop in terms of uh, the cost structure on public meeting places. So, this would just be for calendar year 2023? Um, that would be. Uh, until. Yeah, how about until further notice? notice? You already have reservations in the system right Those you so have have, you'd have to make it apply to any new reservation right. something along that line but it would end at the end so like if we decide we have a lot more business than you guys maybe want to handle maybe we might want to increase well you yeah. can't you can only have one mentor in here at a time no so. i'm talking about more days and stuff like that that you would like saying yeah, you don't want to reassess next year oh, right. oh, still sorry. A bit chunky oh i'm sorry right okay. yeah, I mean, so it doesn't you know if it's really becoming a burden on the town mm -hmm. staff Higher well, fees do make it. Yeah, well, this will probably slow it down. Um, so I'll move to uh, adopt the manager's recommendation to um, <coughs> adopt a revised fee for the steel community room rental. $50 for the first two hours, $10 an hour thereafter. Do I hear? Okay, we have a motion uh, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of uh, the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The fee structure has been amended according to the recommendation of the town manager. Um, town charter. Uh, I suggested that we add this uh, to the uh, agenda tonight um, because uh, it can provide some additional flexibility on how uh, we manage the affairs of the town. Um, one of those uh, would be the potential of uh, uh, looking at a um, local uh, option tax, uh, which could provide uh, another uh, uh, avenue of revenue uh, to gain revenue. Uh, in a, uh, as opposed to raising taxes, which may or is likely to become uh, an issue uh, going forward as we look at some higher costs uh, going into uh, next year. Um, and then there may be uh, some other issues that uh, it would uh, allow for us to manage uh, town's affairs uh, in a way that uh, is going to be more... Uh, convenient for the town. Anyone care to address this or have a particular issue or concern they want to address within this? Um, do you know which communities in the lo our local sphere have options? I know Stowe does. Uh, no, not all of them. Uh, it's a growing list. Um, give me a second. So Stowe definitely has a charter. I guess I'm happy to speak to, I think, like, yes, I'm not negating or minimizing a local option tax to me. One, I'm curious what our goal for our conversation today is, but I think what I have found interesting is that many, and this is what I'm more interested in, here are municipalities with our size and level of staffing and use of the municipal manager form of government. Um, have charters that allows them to be more flexible. And maybe not quite our size, but I would say that my roommate works in Williston, and so her town employment is actually governed by the town of Williston's charter. And so in particular, I've said I love planning and zoning. We have a funky part of the reason I was in planning and zoning director interviews is because since in the absence of a charter, in a Dillon rural state, we default to state statute. And so there's scenarios like us having to appoint the zoning administrator, even though Tom as the municipal manager and whoever the planning and zoning director is effectively going to supervise them. And I would love to just empower him to hire him like every other person, but we're kind of handicapped by what having to follow state law. So to me, actually, that's, you know, the planning commission. I mean, when I was planning commission chair, we've spent three meetings interviewing candidates and not that mm -hmm. the volunteers weren't able to do that effectively, but in terms of a use of time and who actually is most day-to-day -day managing a staff person, 
I think it also creates a weird dynamic for municipal staff, like it's just, but to me, things like that can't be addressed until we have a charter. So do I wish there was a cleaner, clearer, easier solution? <laughs> yes, but I think to me, that's one of the reasons a charter is appealing is to have the tools to address that. I guess my thought would be, I'm curious about, do we have to start big? So the, I'll say it once, but the like Bill Shepelet joke would be you could have a charter that says we will follow the general laws of the state of Vermont and to we should, the municipal manager can hire a zoning administrator, period. <laughs> and in practicality, I don't think we should do that. But I don't know how much of our conversation tonight is about like vision or process or it's just checking in about like, do we think it's a good idea? Um, yeah, I mostly wanted to just get a general sense uh, from the board uh, as to whether this is something that we do want to explore, and if so, then we can go direct uh, the town manager to address uh, some of these issues like you just mentioned. Uh, if you could identify similar sized towns that have a charter and what the impact has been, uh, and then also uh, what the process would be. and. Uh, I tend to agree with you that uh, simpler uh, may be better uh, and not make this, you know, uh, go, go look at, at every possible opportunity but identify some key interests uh, like uh, the uh, hiring of uh, the uh, town planner um, and um, I think notably uh, the uh, local option tax. Yeah, Kane. Okay. Um, what I'd like to speak to on this issue, just boil it down, past the appointing of zoning managers and the local option tax and really just boiling it down to a town charter gives the townspeople an ability to govern themselves outside of Dillon's rule. We, as the town of Waterbury and the voters of Waterbury, would be able to decide for ourselves what, how, and how we don't want our town to be run instead of having to look to the state house for all our answers. And I think at this point, with the size of our town growing and the need to be making changes that maybe the state doesn't necessarily have the answers for at this time, it would behoove us to look into this issue with the idea that eventually we would agree on how we would do it, not if we're going to do it. Okay. I guess I would add there's also some charter issues that are, um, you know, if you read the city of Essex Junction, for example, which just enacted a charter, it has a lot of sections, but a lot of those sections refer to simply state statute and says they'll follow the statute. But there are some areas that may seem a little mundane but can clarify, for example, you could specify in your charter your process for filling a select board vacancy if it occurs midterm. Mm -hmm. You could clarify in your charter the interest and penalties and taxes enacted in your charter, send that up for a vote every year. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some smaller things that might be of importance to you. Um, every town does it differently. It need not be in the end of a long, complex document. Um, but you might, you might find that in Waterbury there's certain uh, there's certain examples from other towns that you like. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, would be, uh, I'm hearing a positive response. Uh, would someone care to make a motion to direct the uh, uh, municipal manager to find some of the examples that we've just discussed uh, and uh, bring those back to us uh, to uh, outline some options uh, to move forward with us? Yeah, I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. Um, Alyssa, that uh, bill that was, if you look on the computer there, the one that you just gave in the bill. It's VLT Legislative bill. Summary Week 13. Yeah, it's wondering it's to, on the left. It speaks to uh, uh, local options tax and the ability for towns to maybe not have to have the charter. Yeah, there's been conversation about that and I believe proposed bills for some years. Don't quote me on some years, but there's been a lot of chatter, chatter about that. Um, <laughs> where the South Hero is what's listed. <laughs> where the legislature would give towns the authority to have a local option tax without a charter. You just have to have a town meeting vote. Um, I, guess, but, I 
guess to say that my other, my other concern is that they're kind of out now what a charter it entails, but uh, <coughs> does, it, does, it, does having a charter require us hold our feet to the fire in things that we maybe don't, are not interested in? I guess that was my only other concern with that. Not necessarily, because you can ultimately um, you can limit your charter to just the items of importance to you. And the rest automatically defaults to state statute. So you know, to, to you know, what you said, Bill Sheplock's example is in essence saying, "If it ain't broke, don't fix it." Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, that's what, as I think has been said, I think we need some more information on towns that have options taxes, towns that have charters, what their levels of charters are. You know, I think. There are some things like what Alyssa said makes a lot of sense to have a charter, but I'm I'm a little hesitant just to have a charter if we're just looking at an options tax. As it was just said, there may be the ability to have an options tax without having a charter. So I think we kind of need to explore some inf information and before we kind of rush into a decision. All right. Uh, Alyssa, you have your hand up? Well, in response to that, like, I think they're both really important, and I think in my mind they are two separate policy issues. And right now it is a required mechanism, and maybe that will change. Right. Um, but I think they're both important reasons. Personally, I fi can find merit in both of them, but I think they are two different. I think, to me, having the conversation of charter is an important conversation right. to have on whatever its merits are. And having a conversation about local option tax is an important conversation to have on its merit. So I would move, Roger made the motion, so I want to say it's your motion, though I know for a chair for Mallies you don't, but um, I would move that the uh, select board encourage the manager to research comparable municipalities to Waterbury's size and whatever other relevant characteristics um, with charters and um, do we have any other? Personally, I would be interested in a potential proposed processes um, mm -hmm. and timelines if we were interested in moving forward with adopting one. Yeah. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. I'll get back to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we should vote on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Without any further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, we are directing the town manager to go forward uh, as directed. Okay. Right. Um, hi, Chris. Yeah, well, thanks, Chris. Uh, the April 17th agenda has been kind of developed uh, by our young. Uh, <laughs> a young one. <laughs> Smooth. Good. Good one. Uh, maybe, and, and I know, so we are over time, but I don't think it's yet April 4th in terms of the minutes. Uh, so hopefully we will uh, get out of here before the turn of midnight. So that'll be the Good third. Catch. I'll update that on the track. Um, and this will be. Other consent agendas. Any uh, any other particular concerns, additions, or uh, items of note uh, within the proposed agenda for uh, the next meeting, which will be the seventeenth? Okay. <coughs> uh, yes, Alyssa. Um. I did that. I, so so I, 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 yeah, I, I signed that. So there's um, there was tobacco legislation, settlement legislation that came through a few years ago, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You could essentially opt to do it on your own or, or join the, the state's lawsuit. Um, and I think if you do, I think we opted to join the state lawsuit. So right. I signed the documentation, which would give us our share of the settlement money. It's really hard for me to tell you how much that is and when it's going to come through. Um, and then I'm not quite. It, it appears to me that we have to we have to devote that money towards. Sorry, 
Opioid, not, not Opioid, thank you. I just, the LCT was sending the link by the 17th, which is why looking at this yeah, agenda. Like, wait, that <laughs> <goes through? laughs> yeah, right. There yeah. may be some accounting about how we spend that money that's opioid related, but I also think there's a strong argument that our state police contract has a pretty substantial cost element that's related to that, as does the ambulance service. But we don't, you don't need any action from us. Don't need any action from me. Question. Um, <laughs> uh, my uh, proclivity towards zoning aside, I find 10 minutes an unrealistic time frame for a readoption of a bylaw. Okay. <laughs> so fine. I'm proposing my. Maybe yeah, I wouldn't need I don't think that. It, I don't. I wish not to make this an expectation that I bring you a draft Perfect. every time. <laughs> and I miss, but, I don't want to discourage um, you either. But um, because next <coughs> week, the two weeks from now is already so heavily yeah. Yeah. Uh, taken, I did want to put it in writing so it was very evident that it's yes. going to be a heavy agenda. But mm -hmm. no, that's finally said. What, how much time would you like to devote to um, the one-year extension of the interim bylaw? I think even 20 minutes just, okay. hopefully it's quicker. Hopefully you go ahead. Okay. I wasn't sure, honestly, if maybe there was any real discussion or very just extending it, so it might that's be. That's true, so maybe it could be quick. I and we we're so kind of following the times. Any okay, okay, okay. So, so optimistic? <laughs> optimistic. We halfway, anyway. we could do 15. Okay. Can, can we Five. have, along with that, in that mode, an update from the Planning Commission of where we are with the ultimate zoning rewrite? Yes, but I would vote at a different meeting. Yeah. This is my hot take. That could be a long conversation. Maybe that's a parking lot thing. But well, I, I think maybe the following meeting. But yeah, okay. but it's something that has to happen fairly soon mm -hmm. to move that forward. Plus, they got the grant funding. You know, the town right. received the grant right. funding for Yeah, their, their so plan for um, keep uh, making this a, a public process. Right. Yeah, so sorry. you want yes. the parking lot? An update from planning? Update from the planning commission on where we are with the uh, town wide zoning rewrite. Okay. No, okay. <laughs> um, is between now and next meeting ample time to get the info together about a charter, or do we need more time on that? <coughs> just for you to get your information to us. I don't know if we may be ready at that point to do something, but we might. I think it would be helpful to have the information exactly. at the earliest possible time. Right. Okay. We've been talking about it for the last two years. So are we add, you're adding that to the agenda? Uh, I was gonna ask if it, I would have support in that. Decision. I mean, if you want to give me more time, I won't argue. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, you, I think you're going to end up doing interviews for those appointments. Yeah, that's yeah. my concern, just timing-wise. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to show up a Let's bunch say, of could time. Could Tom share it, but we don't discuss it, or we discuss it briefly? Sure. Yeah. I, I support them do it sooner than later. I'm just trying to. Yeah, I don't know that we need to have a, a lot of discussion about it uh, sure. as long as we get the information. Yeah. Yeah. We could do like check in on next steps on charter just so that we put it yeah. on the Let's do that. Check in on next steps. Um, and then uh, we also uh, asked uh, for more information on both uh, 100 on 100 and the circus Marcus uh, permits. So those got to be uh, put and I put those you know, relatively high up so that we can get past them. Okay, with, well we, with the input that we're looking for. The, the, the 715 item um, has actually been advertised at 710, so I can't, there's okay. too much yeah. wiggle room. Yeah. 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 We'll drop it down below um, about that. Um, but I can put 100 on 100 circus circus above the appointments, the board appointments, if you wish. Yes. Okay. Or should we do it later? Do we, I so would that say all later. Our interview friends don't have to wait. We want to have Yeah, well, I guess these here. people really are not going to be. Yeah. They need to get out. All right. All right. Let's put it before the presentation of the quarterly finals then. Okay. So uh, this list that I've provided you on this draft agenda is current as of today. Um, you'll look, if you look, you'll see that um, most of these have a number of candidates for the seats. So are you, th are you thinking that you're going to do interviews for all of them? That's my question. So we didn't have any application questions? You know, in terms of I have like emails. you just have names? Or no, I, I do have emails from everyone. Some of them are biographies. 
Some of them are one line sentences. Yeah. Um, I, no one really gave me a, we have, a directive. Do we have more than one person interested for anything but planning? Yeah, now we have two for the tree and only one seat. Um, we have a, a number of weird seats available for rec that we now have three people for. So I don't know if they're going to take a three year seat, a one year seat, or a two year seat. Would it be possible for our select board liaisons to discuss the positions with those individuals and bring back, you know, bring back one name for planning as, as your recommendation? Sorry, I'm throwing you under the bus right there. I was saying, no, speaking personally, I don't, I mean, I have thoughts on who I think planning is, but I think if it's a, uh, I think this is one I feel would, would feel strange not offering all the candidates to the select board because I think okay. it's a select board decision. My thought would be, and I'm wondering, again, maybe on the liaison, like, I brought up an application before. We haven't done it before, but I do wonder, at least on the ones that are contested, do contested, um, with more than one interested applicant, do we ask for a paragraph? I know some have already mm -hmm. done it, but do we like for each of them say, hi, Martin's in, could you please provide background on why you would like to be on the tree committee just so we can I think what's hard and time consuming is when we're having that narrative with each of these people in the meeting. And then for the ones with terms, do we ask, do you have a preference on a one or two year term? I mean, we've, again, we've done it informally, orally at a meeting, which is fine. But um, I hear, because I don't, I don't, I think to the extent we can streamline, I would just say, at least for planning commission, which is a tough one for me for a variety of reasons, but I would want to have the ability to offer my qualified opinion for whatever reason and not feel like I was imposing that on the board. Totally agree with everything you just said. Mm -hmm. And so, that would just be for the uh, so-called contested uh, positions? Well, that's my question here. I don't know if, is it still open? I'm forgetting mm -hmm. about deadline. Yeah, I gave them till the Thursday before the meeting. That way I, I, I can get all these emails to you <laughs> on Friday yeah. mm -hmm. of the weekend to look them over, right? Mm -hmm. um, and get a sense of who is who and what they bring to the board. Many of them really did do, like Zinn Wolf, I know he sent me a nice long email, Amy Marshall Carney did, Monica Callan did, um, Stacy Lambert did, you know, this, I don't know Robert Adler, but his, his is literally like, yes, I'd like to be, you know. So I can write back to Mr. Adler and say, look, there's four folks vying for this one chair, can you provide more information to the board? I'm happy to do that. Um, I also have big concerns about the fact that the Conservation Commission has no applicants. Nobody has reached out for me to me for that, and they're um, th they also have a lot of seats. Don't they have like yeah. seven seats, Tom? Well, I th I, from what I've heard, they want to decrease the number of people because I think they they went up in the number of seats. Because I'm, because we had a pretty full. Well, you're the liaison, so this one I vote right. for the liaison that I'd you come have, back with the I'd be more than glad. I'm going <laughs> to see, I'm going to see Alan that. Thompson tomorrow. Alan's expansion. resigning. Mm -hmm. well, I can speak to him. About oh, of course that. you can. I'm just saying he's. Right. So their seats are getting fewer yeah. and fewer. So I guess if you're okay, I mean, I don't know what the board. I'm not trying to propose on behalf of all, but if you're willing for folks who didn't provide an explanation mm -hmm. to just request it, mostly because to me it's like, so it's an even playing field of mm -hmm. like, I might think I just need to send a thing, mm -hmm. which does get them on mm -hmm. this list. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't know if in the ones with terms, that right. should be part of just say like, we have multiple different, we have a one, two, and three year term, would you have a preference? Or mm -hmm. we just do that in real time based on mm -hmm. people, I'm open to that. That That's might be easier, be easier in real easier. time. Yeah. It's really just the rec that you're, unless we can find some bodies yeah. for conservation, it's really just yeah. the rec. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a good idea to get information from every candidate who runs for a board or commission. Why? Uh, with, with the proviso that it's a page, uh, uh, limit right. on one page of the commission. <laughs> Well, I mean, person. I've not heard anyone propose the idea of a, a quasi-application, right. but certainly if there's a template, well, perhaps not Oh, no, me. oh, no, I know. If there's specific things you want to know, then 
I mean, heck, it's a lot easier for me to say, look, these are the six questions they right. really want you to answer, and anything else you'd like to contribute, we welcome. Okay. But I, it's a little late for me to go back to oh, all totally. of them. Right. 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 Um, it's like, to me, it's like, why do you want to run for this position, and what are your qualifications? So those, those are the one key. One or yeah. Mm -hmm. Next year. All right. Well, there's only a couple. There's only a couple of people who um, I would need to circle back to. Yeah, circle back. So I'll do that tomorrow, giving them plenty of time to respond. And um, I guess I just need to know whether you do you intend for me to invite them all yeah, here yeah. for conversations that night. It sounds like we do. Okay. Uh, and uh, so we'll just try to keep it uh, concise and to the point, and maybe try to limit uh, how much time we spend with each candidate. You know, I'm thinking if there are mechanism. <laughs> the, um, I have deeply imprinted in my brain when we did ranked choice voting for the housing task force, which was 20 minutes of dead air on Zoom, and I'm still sorry to everyone, but I'm wondering about like, do we all? I don't want to come on behalf of the planning commission, but you know, thinking once we get those wonderful responses that Karen's willing to help compile, how we? I think we should invite them all, but how do we keep that conversation? You're mm -hmm. asking More if brief. you're inviting the planning commission to the meeting as well? Oh, no, sorry, oh. no. I'm just saying I think we should invite them all in the past. Sometimes it's gotten, like, really detailed on certain policy issues, on mm. certain things that just takes a lot of time, and I'm wondering about how we, just how we have that conversation efficiently. But, mm. uh, well, we could ask everyone to uh, present themselves uh, during a, a two-minute uh, presentation. And then if there are particular questions, we can ask, but also try to nice. limit that to maximum of five minutes per candidate. Does that sound reasonable? And I'm not sure that uh, on some of these, like the rec committee, where it's non, not contested, yeah. whether we need to hear from everybody. I mean, right. happy to have them there and uh, to respond to any questions that may come up, but they don't necessarily need to go through the full I vetting think they process. Should. Yeah, I think not they should. In that exercise, you just got to vet out who's going to get the three-year seats, the one-year seat, and the two-year seat, the unexpired. Right. Okay. I can I can try to do that ahead of time if you'd like. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind just uh, seeing if there, uh, anyone would like to uh, put their head, head in for any, those those different slots uh, in advance, that would be helpful. Okay. Um, one other thing uh, is that uh, Monica Callen also asked to be appointed to the steering committee of the um, SE committee, uh, SE group study of the um, Hope Davy and Ice Center uh, and I talked uh, study, which is near completion. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so Tom and I talked about it briefly on Friday. Our conclusion is that uh, the interest is to bring um, uh, the artistic interests into that discussion, which we think will and certainly can and should happen during the implementation phase, but that uh, at this point we don't know whether the direction of the um, steering committee can be altered completely. Uh, Alyssa. Yeah, and I would just say there's actually a pretty long and storied history as to <coughs> getting to the current steering committee configuration that right. has contested and other folks who've asked for seats. So personally, I would say, one, as a parking lot thing, we have to get a public presentation of that, right? We have to get a public, there's one more presentation of the final plan. So just mm -hmm. to say, it will come to this group, I think, <coughs> Personally, as the rep on it, I think it would be really tough to reopen it, and I think would welcome public comment. I think Monica has provided public comment. I know I've read some of her <laughs> comment, but I know like Conservation Commission in particular really wanted a seat, did not wind up with one. So I think to suddenly add someone at this stage for a variety of reasons would be really hard. Okay. All right. Uh, and I'll be happy to get, uh, go ahead. Is there a vacancy? I don't think there's a vacancy on that steering floor. Has someone left, or you know, I don't think we could just add a different body. Mm -hmm. We already have a working steering committee, right? Plus, you know, they, they, an additional person wouldn't be up to speed where every of the other steering committee members. Would yeah, be. I think that 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 would be my concern as well. You don't want uh, to relive the whole thing. 
Okay. But I would just say, like, Steve has been really great in staffing it into forwarding to the entire steering committee every comment that's received. So I would just say, you know, it's essentially wrapped up. So there isn't a continuing, my response would be steering committee role, but all public comment is forwarded to the steering committee and included in the report. And Monica's input uh, is among Bring staff. Bring comments forward to the committee. Okay. Uh, I'm satisfied with that unless we need any further discussion. Um, I just wanted to like CBRPC to add to this list if we maybe got someone for that regional planning commission. Oh, you want that on there for that week? Well, too? I don't if we can have someone. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. um, Good idea. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion on the next next meeting's agenda? Thank you for preparing this. Was super, yes, super right. helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very helpful. helpful. I'll try to, to do that. Into a young and vivacious uh, assistant. <laughs> At this point, uh, we are uh, looking at uh, potentially going into executive session. Does anyone want to make a motion to that effect? I motion to go into executive session. For the purpose of discussing personnel. Second. Please, sir.